Hey there, before we start the episode, I want to share something super cool that I'm going to be a part of Saturday, December 17th at noon Pacific time. I'm in the cast of a live-streamed table read of an unmade Tales from the Crypt script, Dead Easy. This is a movie sequel that never was and is incredibly infamous among Tales from the Crypt fans. Besides me, the cast of this thing is truly incredible. I'll be joining Sean Astin, Jake Busey, Tia Carrer, Brett Cullen, John Kassir, and Leslie Zemeckis, and the whole thing will of course be hosted by the Crypt Keeper himself. This is also a charity stream for the Motion Picture and Television Fund, which provides both working and retired members of the entertainment industry with health and social services. To get access to the live stream of The Table Read, which is again December 17th at noon Pacific time, please make a donation of any amount, big or small, to the MPTF at mptf.com slash donate. Then send your receipt to dead easy2022 at gmail.com. I'll also put all of this information in the episode description too. The day before the event, you'll receive a link to the live stream and the deadline to donate is midnight on December 16th. Please come join us. It'll mean so, so much to me to have Dead Meat fans there for this really cool opportunity I'm so, so lucky to be part of. Thank you so much, everyone. Now here is our discussion of the menu. What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little passes of business. You're dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James. And we're married and we like to get scared together. Also joining us, James Gressel. Yes, we've got a mic and camera on him this week. Because this week we're reviewing The Menu. Yes, which is a movie that Gressel went into saying, I am ready to be personally attacked for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was. <laughs> yeah, Gressel knows a lot more about food and fine dining than we do. And especially the kind of things that this movie is parodying, taking pot shots at, even like stylistically borrowing from is stuff that we're a lot less familiar with. Yeah, I think this movie is very enjoyable without all that knowledge. We had a great time, oh, yeah, yeah. and we're not foodies, but uh, I was sitting next to Gressel in the theater, and he was just a ball of energy the whole time. I, I loved every moment where I was the only one in the theater laughing. I mean, there were not a lot of people. <laughs> there were two other people. Yeah, 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 but still... <laughs> But it they was, were into it. They were totally. Oh, and yeah. They, they Very did, funny movie. They did. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. The menu is hilarious. Uh, let's say yeah. that right up top. Border, like, I've seen some people debating whether or not it counts as a horror movie. It's horror. My theory is I think people don't see this as a horror movie because there are so many A-list actors in it. You think that's why? I think that's a big reason why. People... But Anya Taylor is ours. I know. Like we're loaning her to you. Yeah, Netflix. yeah. We're letting <laughs> we're letting Hollywood borrow her, but she is a true child of horror. She's ours. <laughs> but no, do you know what I mean? There's like Nicholas Holt and John Leguizamo and Ray Fiennes. Like it's just that many a listers in a a horror movie. Just don't see that that often i think people are just tend to think of horror as a more narrow construct than it is i well, mean there's we, that too of course we've had this discussion countless times on the show but uh, you know uh, when people are laughing too much and it's not like an outright horror comedy like tucker and dale they tend to be like oh is that really horror uh there are a lot of you know character moments in this movie and it's clearly satirical and i feel like sometimes people can be like well that's not really horror but I think this is definitely horror. Horror is a big old wide umbrella, and this falls under it. it I mean, it's... Hmm. Do you think this is similar to Ready or Not in tone? It is. it is. Um, you don't think so, Gressel? I think Ready or Not is m closer to comedy on the spectrum than it, this is. They're different styles. Ready I, or Not has a funny style that I think this... Doesn't. But this has the fucking title cards. How is that not a funny style, you know? It's saying, yeah, yeah the fucking... Uh, Tyler's bullshit. Tyler's bullshit is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. It was I, not funny for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I almost... And and these they're not totally similar, so I think at first people may be like, what, this that comparison makes no sense. But I almost think of like a squid game in terms of 
just the weird heightened reality this takes place in. Yeah. Like, everyone's a little bit exaggerated. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's meant to be... Like, super realistic. Realistic, yeah. yeah. Although, you know, I saw some people being like, I didn't buy that... You know, all the, the cooks were following the chefs. Were, it's like, it's a cult. Hello, have you ever heard of, do you even Heaven's Gate, bro? <laughs> it's for real, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think this movie came out on the anniversary of Jonestown. Oh, I think I saw that, actually. Someone said that. Yeah. And unless they were bullshitting. Like, if you just realized, it's oh, it's wild. a cult, then, yeah. And also just, like, I was kind of talking about a bit ago where it's just this Everyone's slightly exaggerated. You think of like, you know, any underlings to an uh, either an artist or someone whose work you really respect. People like do commit their whole selves to people they view as, as great and will kind of slavishly devote themselves to them. So I think that's what that's supposed to be too. That's even framed like a cult. Yeah. Where like the bun- he's, they he's got this. Like, yeah, he, yeah. He's got a bunker. They're, they're in this little like uh you know, their living situation and the way that it's framed or he's got like this pulpit that he speaks from and like uh, is the is the 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 line set up almost like a cross with him at the top of it. Like there's there's a lot of religious yeah. imagery where it's very all wearing it's, white. It sounds yeah, like yeah, it's they very don't, cultish. They don't really sleep. When she talks about their work schedule, that's one of the hallmarks of a cult, of a cult too, sleep deprivation. Oh, just keep everyone exhausted. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Because your your brain just doesn't work as good. Does not. Your brain starts acting real funky. Ask any college student. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the menu, definitely a, a funny movie. Dark. Uh, gets a little midsummery at times. Because, I mean, again, we're talking about cults. So that's in there. Um, yeah. Amazing cast. A lot of great actors, you know, from the small roles to the bit like the leads in this, the the three big names in this are all so fantastic. Uh, with Nicholas Holt, I'm not that familiar with Nicholas Holt because I, I never love watched the great Nicholas Holt. He's so the fucking great funny is in so this, fucking good, and he's a huge reason why that show is so good. He he is so good at playing just the biggest piece of shit but you still like him despite it you just not in this i mean you not like him i guess just you you like like to watch him him. yeah yeah, for sure i loved watching him yeah yeah Yeah. but god his fucking character yeah uh it it is one of those movies where every character is like shitty Mm -hmm. but you know if that's done right like it's body's body's character's not shitty no not every character uh annie taylor joy is uh completely normal and a great audience surrogate great excellent in fact you know we were saying before going into this movie that annie taylor joy is in a lot of things lately she's in a lot a I'm, lot of things i don't want to say i'm getting the annie taylor joy fatigue but it's just i'm not there's so she's in everything she is. i'm also just feeling a little bitter because i Princess don't Peach. i really don't like her princess Peach. To be fair, we've only heard the commercial like yeah, a few lines, but still, yeah, that whole voice casting thing is a fucking mess. But I will say that we had that conversation before this movie, and during the movie, I'm like, no, this is why I like Annie Taylor Joy a lot. She's reminding me of she she has the like groundedness uh, in this role. I, I, you know, I feel like this role is a bit more of a normal person character for her than what I'm used to, at least. Because in Last Night in Soho, she's kind of ephemeral. You know, she's yeah. this very confident uh uh almost otherworldly literally figure who is like i am the best at this and like her fall from grace is really tragic but she still seems like on a pedestal Mm -hmm. whereas this she has to be the quote-unquote everyman that we can relate to and then um the revelations about her character and their relationship i think work really well uh and and just i i like how all the information is revealed in this movie about who these characters are and what's going on. And you know, going into it that obviously this is a horror movie. And we, if you saw the trailer, I feel like the trailer gives a lot away. Uh, But I I was still surprised by things. Yeah. The trailer, surprisingly, the trailer is not as revealing as I thought it was going to be because I kind of went into this expecting at least some sort of most dangerous game kind yes. of hunt or some cannibalism yes. or, but it does. That's, that's the thing that you expect the most right. with and this premise. I appreciate that this movie does swerve away several times from what I'm expecting it to do. 
I just think you set up this premise of you're on an island with a bunch of rich people and it's this fine dining. I mean, you immediately, your brain goes to a few very obvious places and this doesn't do that. It's not that at all. Yeah. The other thing about the trailer is, you know, we saw it a lot because this movie came out in November. So we were there in October at the theaters. We saw this trailer. So many times. And like, after a couple of times seeing it, I was like, is this going to be like kind of annoying Marvel-esque humor quips but the the thing they always stuck in my craw and still does a little bit is the like we gel they gel we gel yeah and i was worried the whole movie would be that but it's actually extremely funny and uh even in context the lines in the trailer that i thought would be a little like too i don't know corny or whatever they work within the movie well i swear that they used a different take for that definitely a different because i I remember when this trailer came out and i i was like i cannot wait to see this movie with james and chelsea and you guys were very lukewarm on it be like because of the kind of humor or whatever but Mm -hmm. like there was a nuance and you said you said like the main three actors but like i think it is for it's like hong chow Chow. Chow. honestly she's kind of the standout in this there was so much more subtlety in her performance than the trailer indicated yeah like there i i was worried that we were gonna get a lot of what she did in Watchmen, and it was gonna be kind of one note or she was gonna be kind of this robotic mater d but which she was but she wasn't Mm -hmm. and i'm really grateful yeah that like it wasn't what you guys were worried it was going to be. And and on that note, Ray Fine's character is so interesting to me because you could just make this character uh, a, a completely opaque, impenetrable villain. And that's one way to go about this movie. But it, no, he's not. Chef is so fucking human and, yeah. and like... Just, I don't know, vulnerable. I wrote at one point that Ray finds in this has a very kind face, which yeah. is weird to say about this character. But, and like Ray finds can be a uh, very fucking scary. I'm not even just thinking about Voldemort. I'm thinking of like Schindler's <laughs> List. Yeah. Like, oh, he, fuck. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. Yeah. 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 And he is so good at playing a, like a, yeah, stone cold, just villain. But this, I don't know how he does it. He looks so, it's kind of like you feel a little bit like Nicholas Holt where you have this feeling of, I want this guy to like me. Mm-hmm. I want him to think that I'm not like all the other people in this restaurant. You to, know? to that end though, I'm I'm also really glad that they didn't make him into a kind, or, or, we're, we're doing spoilers a little bit, I guess. Um, I, like I'm not giving away the ending, but like he's not an anti-hero. No. no. I think it's up for debate because I did see some people co- commenting like, why did we... I don't know. They might have just been reading it wrong because they were complaining that we spent too much time hearing his justification, but that's what makes it work is he, he, that character fully buys into his worldview. But to me, I'm still like, no, you're still wrong. Even though I'm enjoying this performance. It's like Nicholas Holt. It's like, no, you are the bad guy. And I feel bad for some of these people, even though there are also people in who in real life I would be annoyed by or dislike. Like, you are still the worst person here, clearly. It's a, it's one of those fun kinds of characters, though, where, like, yeah, in real life, you can recognize that this is not a good person and they are not correct in any sense of the word. But in the context of a movie, it's fun to live vicariously through them in this environment that you're like, this isn't real. And it's kind of fun to root for this person in a very... Like in a way where so you're. So it sounds aware. like you do think he's an antihero type. No, I. You're do- talking about rooting for. I'm not him. saying that. I'm saying it's fun. No, I think it's he is a villain that you kind of. I don't know, like the Joker. The you would never categorize the Joker as an antihero. Ooh, be careful there. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. I I would like. I, I'm thinking like you know. I love like Heath Ledger's Joker. I don't think I would ever call him an antihero, but that's why he's so much fun. Is because it's fun to indulge a little bit in like the worst part of yourself and like. I agree with you, Chelsea. I I think that like something that kind of pisses me off with some people and like reactions to movies and stuff is like not under like not being able to understand that villains are villains yeah and like just because he chef explains his justifications or or tries to go into the meanings of why he's doing what he's doing doesn't mean that we have to be on his side right like like he's just so he's so fun to watch and that performance is so beautiful that like it doesn't matter that he's the bad guy. You still want to watch him. It's like compare him to Jeffrey Combs and would you rather who is also a delight to watch, yeah. but is is much more uh, reprehensible. 
It's been a minute since I've seen that, but I think Would You Rather doesn't also have the foundation of do you hate all those people as much? No, they're okay, all very sympathetic. Okay, so that's sympathetic. part of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is like you, it's like any good slasher. You meet this cast of people where you're like, they're all going to fucking die. And there's something about each of them, save our main character, that you're like. And a f- I think a few others. I can't wait for these people. To, I mean, the assistant. John, Legu- was, John Leguizamo was assistant. No, oh, yeah. On, and even John Leguizamo is yeah. charming enough in this. <laughs> well, it's because he's John Leguizamo. Like, I got a soft spot for him. It's, there's that, too, working in favor of Ray Fiennes in this that you don't get with Jeffrey Combs and Would You Rather, which is why that movie's so bleak. And it's also the, uh, Ray Fiennes' character and Jeffrey Combs' characters are opposite in their, like, class uh, kind of positioning yeah because ray fine's character positions himself with service workers and, and that's why it's fun to yeah. root for him mm-hmm. that's what i'm saying I'm just, I, I just think the rest of the cast does so well that i'm i feel bad for, like and yeah you can i'm i i think people and this is a pet peeve of my own like we talk about movies in general and just the, the discourse quote unquote is people think you can only feel like one certain way about mm-hmm. the the series of events that happens in a movie like I don't know I just I feel like I ha- I like to have a more nuanced relationship with characters and I think there's this weird team mentality where it's like who's and the movie kind of does this too where it's like are you going to are you going to side with, with the them, yeah. yeah the service workers or the people who are eating the, the, the givers takers. or takers mm-hmm. right but it's I don't know. You can you can feel more than one thing. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, okay, like an example I thought of is I love Cersei in Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. And I love when she blows up the sept. It's fucking great. It's amazing. She's standing there drinking that wine and it's my favorite. But also at the same time as a, you know, like bigger picture, like fan of that story. I also am like, no, she's clearly the fucking villain. There is nothing anti-hero about her whatsoever. Yeah. So it's just it's two sides of the same coin that make up 100 percent of my enjoyment of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree with you, Chelsea. I think if you're if you don't have that then you're missing something that makes stories special. And yeah. like like that's a problem I think with a lot of superhero movies is villains aren't strong enough and like all the good ones have amazing villains and like you need that balance. It's a food thing. You need the balance <laughs> right. to complete the dish. Otherwise it's it's not right. There's right. something missing with it and it's Tyler's bullshit. It's also why <laughs> in all of the best slashers you have your final girl. You have your counterpart to the villain because we love watching, you know, Michael kill an entire town of people, or at least I think we still do. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> you like, you have Lori. There's a reason Lori so popular is like you have to have that kind of, I don't know, same with like Nancy and Freddie. It's mm-hmm. like that's why those duos work so well. Yeah. They kind of entertain both sides of what we enjoy getting from stuff like this. Mm-hmm. It's why it's why Anna Taylor Joy's character works really well too because I think it is such a solid counterpart to this chef that is kind of fun to, you know, watch and even if you're not rooting for him, you still kind of you, you kind of get it, right? I think yeah. especially if you've worked a service job or, mm-hmm. yeah. And by the way, it is Anya Taylor-Joy. I know that you might just think it's our Michigan accent saying, ah, but it's <laughs> it's not Anya Taylor-Joy. I've heard her say it. So, yep. and I've heard Robert Eggers say it, and he found her. She's like 15 mm-hmm. or whatever in The Witch. Okay, let's head out of the spoiler-free zone. I have no idea if that was a natural transition, by the way. We just had to take a break. Sorry, so, it was my fault. Sorry, if it's everybody. totally weird, that's why. But it's hey, all it's all good. good. It's all good. Uh, yeah. So that's our spoiler-free. Uh, I, I, I want to. I would say I loved this movie. I, I would say I really, really liked it. I don't know if I'm quite like love this movie. This spoke to me. Yeah, yeah. I figured. <laughs> really liked it. I mean, I'm like right on the verge of loved and really liked. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's. I mean. <laughs> What's funny is that 2022 is so fucking strong that October ended and then we still got a really strong horror movie 
coming out with mm-hmm. this. It's why I, I was thinking like, man, we've been doing so many reviews on the podcast and it's like, it's just because this year is like, there's so many movies. Like I, I think every week there's a movie that everyone is is wanting me to review. Like it's yeah. an emergency. We have to do it. And we missed Pearl, you know? like it's, Yeah, it's I want to review that when it's out on Blu-ray. But at this point, uh, we're going to move into the spoilery part of the discussion. So go see this movie if you haven't. It's only in theaters right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, no streaming. It's a fun theater movie. It, it, it'd it be interesting. I bet the types of audiences, I mean, maybe depending on where you see it, because we went to our local, our Lemley Theater, yeah, which is like, kind of a they show some more snootier. art house kind of. Just the audience was... Or like the at least the other people in there. It was two other dudes. It was light chuckles at stuff. Oh, they were they loved it. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. Laughing their asses but I'm just off. saying yeah. it's a different. It's less rowdy and more like oh yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not Halloween. It, it it's interesting. I'm curious what other people's crowd experiences were with this one. Very different than our our audience with Barbarian, which was a lot of like teens mm-hmm. and that and was terrifier kind of fun. too. Yeah. Yeah. Very rowdy. Let's get to it. Uh. So first course, the first course. Not yet. Not we're yet. Still not the, yet. Yeah. We're not even at the amuse. Not even at the amuse. Yeah. I love yeah. that this movie opens with I think Fox but Searchlight invites you to enjoy the, the menu, menu, which mm-hmm. is kind of fun. Invites you to experience. Yeah. We right away we meet Nicholas Holt and Anya Taylor Joy, and he's he's immediately pissed at her because she's smoking, and that's gonna ruin your palate. Mm-hmm. So they're going to this food tasting. We get right to it, which is nice. Yeah, We're... it's it's clear that he is the one who has paid for it, and he's the one who's into it, and she's coming along uh, with him as a sort of favor. She, like she's not that interested in it or the uh, uh, what's the dish on the ferry ride over there because it's on an island. Oyster? Do they give lemon them pearls on oysters? They give him like something a little. Yeah, it's little... an oyster dish with a mignonette, and I I forget the exact dish from the movie but i believe that this is referencing oysters and pearls from the french laundry which is one of his like famous first courses okay so the french laundry was it three michelin stars french laundry's three michelin stars it's in it's in yuntville which is by napa california it's one of the best restaurants in the world and has been named best restaurant in the world a few times back in the 2000s it's had three michelin stars forever it's yeah. yeah. I, I think I, I saw I tried to get a reservation last year. That was stupid. Impossible. Yeah. I think I saw what the tasting menu there is like 300 a pop. I think now it's just under four. Okay. And this, they say it's 1200 1, ahead. Or 1250 ahead. Cheap. Does that seem cheap for this? For th- what this is. Not the- that this seems cheap. <laughs> it's not. That's insane. No, but it's a ferry ride over to a private island. With only how many people are there? Like 12. 10 or 12? 12 people at 1250 ahead. So, I don't know. It just seems. I think it depends if it's overnight or not. Sure. Yeah. Which I don't think it is. I don't think it is. It they didn't, didn't show like them it. like here's yeah. where you're staying. Yeah. That's what I thought that bunker was at first, and I would be <laughs> like, I did not spend twelve hundred bucks to sleep in a in a tin can with mm-hmm. all these other people. But yeah. Right away, they're talking about mouthfeel. Mouthfeel. And, uh, I do also not like that word you know just living with gressel and hearing him talk about food a lot of this <laughs> stuff rang familiar and i was like this seems accurate yeah. as to the way people talk about food i think i i i haven't watched as much of it like as an adult but growing up i always loved watching food shows with my mom and like my aunt specifically more i was i was obsessed with iron chef mm-hmm. like the original japanese iron chef fully obsessed with it. I had the book um, that was like the kind of history of the show. And I was thinking how uh, Nicholas Holt in this movie talks about how, you know, some people idolize like movie stars or athletes or whatever, but he idolizes chefs. And I was trying to think like, is there like a chef I would be psyched to meet? And honestly, the one I can think of, Iron Chef Chen Kenichi, dude, I would lose my mind. He's still, <laughs> he's still at it. You can eat uh, at his restaurant. At his restaurant, really? That's I think pretty so. cool. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't name a single chef. Gressel, give us your top five. You know Gordon Ramsay. You know Gordon. Sh- yeah, you okay. know Gordon Ramsay. Does he count? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He is, has more Michelin stars than anyone else in the world. What? Does he really? Mm-hmm. No shit. Yeah. He wow. He was the real deal for a while. I love Gordon. I, d- I do too. Yeah. I'm a fan. Um, yeah. my, my personal, what do you say, top three? 
I said five. Five? I, I could do five. My, <laughs> I know my, you can. my personal right now, the chefs that I really like, they're all going to be LA chefs. The ones that I, the one, ones whose food I've eaten, which okay. is different from like the ones whose books I have and admire mm. from afar, but the ones whose food I've eaten that I love, uh, Andy Brava, formerly of Rustic, Rustic Canyon. He has a new thing now called Slow Burn that's really cool. You should check it out. Um, the executive chef at Rustic has a restaurant called Birdie G's. That's Jeremy uh, Fox. Um, he's amazing. Uh, Stephanie Izard, uh, Girl in the Goat. You guys have eaten there. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Good stuff. She's great. Uh, the uh, Justin uh, Petrici. I don't know how to say his last name, but the chef at Anna Jack Thai in mm -hmm. uh, in LA. Anna Jack, real good. Get that. Uh, Anna Jack is really good. Get that chicken. Yeah, and Sarah Welsh from Detroit. Uh, nice. The chef at Marrow in Detroit is fucking awesome oh, Nero? And, yeah I ate there you did yeah. yeah i think her food in detroit is as good as any michelin star food i've had out there here. was good stuff uh they also served us marrow and i did not like it <laughs> oh i i like i like bone marrow i haven't tried <laughs> bone marrow it just tastes like blood you want to taste it's, marrow? It's here, blood fucking, jelly yeah <laughs> suck on a scissors and <laughs> cut your mouth open there you go Marrow. It's, it's an acquired taste eat some toast sure. and you've got the it's dish it's good they for serve. you though it's very good for you marrow well, so is liver not about also to eat that. delicious what? You don't like liver? I don't, I don't think know, I've, I've ever, ever had, had liver. I, I don't suspect that I would like the texture. Yeah. I'm a crunchy guy. Liver seems the opposite of it that. It is soft. Seems like a jelly. Soft and slimy. Kinda. Not slimy. I've seen spongy? some liver. It looks pretty fucking slimy to me, dude. Mm -mm. It's moose-like. I heard that if you if you chop it up Ew, into fine bits worse. and put it into ground beef, you will, you can get all the nutrients without the taste. The taste is very irony. Uh, you'd probably still taste it then, huh? So we got uh, the Andy Taylor-Joy and Nicholas Holt are... Two of 12 people going there. Also yeah. joining them are three dude bros, Tech bros who he calls power tasters. If there wasn't a dress code, at least one of them would have a tech vest on, like that guy in Smile. Oh, yeah. The just the the black, you know, vest mm -hmm. over a dress shirt. Uh, these three tech dudes are pretty funny. One of them was a guy in Succession. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Rob Yang is the actor. Yeah, name. the guy from Volter. <laughs> yeah, uh, really like them. They're they're perfectly douchey. The one tech bro was Pablo Escobar in Weird. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, uh, he's having a great year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's five. You got one old lady who don't meet until we're at the place because she's just sitting in the corner getting real drunk. Mm -hmm. You've got the food critic. Oh, the uh, food critic. And her and like her editor, her editor who slash Toadie, just mm -hmm. the guy who just is so um obsequious to her. These two love NPR. <laughs> <laughs> Only certain programs, though. Only the haughty ones. Only the very... They would be. They would listen, Grussell, to that interview with Lydia Tarr oh, from the 100%. beginning of that movie and be like, mm, mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, th they would be all they about They would be Lydia in the Tarr. audience, yeah, honestly. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's the kind of people we're, we're talking about here. They're, and I hate using this word because I think people... I think people think it means something very different than I, I intend it, but overeducated... Which I know it sounds weird. I don't think anyone can actually be overeducated, but these are the types of people where it's just where it's it's less about knowledge and the enjoyment of things and more just how can I prove that I'm smarter about this thing than you? Mm -hmm. Just knowledge for the sake of lording it over like an elitist kind of I don't know, where it's kind of stripping the joy away of which is a lot of what this movie is about. The yeah. joy of really intrinsically human thing like art or music or food. That's what I mean Yeah, by that. Uh, you've also got John Leguizamo as a um, past his prime actor. And so funny, they don't say his character's name at first. So I was like, is John Leguizamo thought, playing well, himself? You know what? Speaking of, of Weird and Daniel Radcliffe, originally was, Daniel Radcliffe was going to be in this movie as, as himself. himself. And the movie that the chef brings up later was going to be Victor Frankenstein. And it only didn't work out because of a scheduling conflict. I like it being Leguizamo over... It, Radcliffe's too likable. <laughs> yeah. I bet he would play... He has played a dick version of himself before. Yeah. In, uh... Is it extras? He, I forget if he's, like, a dick version of himself. I'm sure he's something, yeah. It, but he also has to be... I like Leguizamo as, like, past his prime, mm -hmm. you know? He's a, he's a I older, middle-aged guy. I think, honestly... 
I would have loved a version of this where he was John Leguizamo and he went and saw The Pest. The Pest. I know when he brought up <laughs> Calling Dr. Sunshine, like, this fictional on, movie, just make it it's The, the pest. pest. Because it has would, to be. It yeah, has to be. It would be. have to That be would drive pest. me to kill John Leguizamo and I really like John Leguizamo. <laughs> yeah. But The Pest made me want to fucking kill him. Uh, he's there with his assistant who I is love, trying to quit her I job. I just love John Leguizamo. Sorry, I'm I just having a John moment Leguizamo. where I'm like, I love he's John He's going to be in Violet Night and that's going to make me see that movie. Honestly, that when he showed up in that trailer, it's like, yeah, I kind of want to see I heard this. David Harbour's having a blast I heard in that movie. I heard it's fun. Wh- why not? It's 2022. Of course it's going to be good. Yeah. No, <laughs> no misses. No misses in 22. Well, yeah. Halloween. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, his assistant who, uh, I know she's a voice actress. She's oh, she right. and Elena. Uh, I was Avalor or Avalon? I think Avalor. I think it's Avalor. Avalor. Um, I like Avalon. James doesn't. I want this in the podcast. Avalon. It's a shitty, awful song. It's awful. It's so bad. It's very, very slow. It's so. It's the the worst of Roxy music possible. They've never recovered in my it in my makes brain. Makes me for them. feel like that song makes me feel like you should be taking me shopping at a mall jewelry store <laughs> for gold jewelry with diamonds in it, and everything is really like glazy for some like the camera lens is all vaselined out do you know what oh that, yeah you yeah. know that's 100 I, I have a french on. manicure like that's just the kind of yeah. yeah thing i think of and then there is a older couple who uh, just an older upper class couple yes. who is there who and the Taylor worst. joy immediately seems no the wife is fine what that's because of what they do later, and because th- th- I'm worried th- that that's me to you. <laughs> but, yes, Anya Taylor Joy notices the older she man. Says, Fuck, and so there's instantly this tension. Yeah, and that's the thing is you get these little moments right off the bat, and you know uh, the other thing is that when they arrive at the island and they're checking in, the uh, is it Elsa? Elsa, the Mater D. Another interesting thing in the original script, her character was supposed to be this very stoic. Aryan looking, I think either Swedish or Nor- it's why her name's Elsa. She was supposed to be like very oh. Northern European, but they just were like, "Fuck it, this act," and like whatever. I didn't yeah. even think twice about it. Yeah, but she I ruled. I think that's Amazing. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she's checking people in. Oh, and, and the food critic was male. Go continue. Okay. They cast it gender blind, which is kind of nice. So she's checking people in and she checks in Nicholas Holt. And then she says a different name for Andy Taylor Joy's character, who is uh, Margot Mills. Uh, she says a different name, and so you're like. Who is this other person that was supposed... And he apologizes for it being awkward. You were like, was that his wife, maybe? And this is his mistress? Yeah. I was like, it must have just been like an what ex-girlfriend. The name was. Yeah. yeah, it was uh, uh, it- Westwalt or something like that. And it's intentionally kind of ambiguous. It's and that's the thing. Kind of it, a- it's another movie like Bodies, 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 where you get a little little pieces of information early on. Mm. Then you get more as the movie goes on. And then in retrospect, it all makes sense. This is a very good a show don't tell movie and it very it's good at exposition especially since this is a kind of one location horror movie where it's all about the characters mm-hmm. and it's kind of crucial to understand who they are but that's hard to do without kind of spoon feeding it and this does it pretty well i think it's remarkable that in a movie where so much of it is explaining yeah. it's not expository yeah like mm-hmm. like the, towing that line where so much dialogue is explicitly the character saying what they're intending to do but it never feels like the movie is telling you the audience what, it's what about. to think or what it's about yeah yeah because you're right because as it as the movie goes on we kind of find out honestly sooner or like earlier in the movie than I was expecting what the whole deal is why they're here what Ray Fiennes is planning for the evening what is going to eventually go down that's all kind of revealed halfway point maybe? yeah I would yeah. say which I think it's it's nice so there's that's not the twist of the movie if there is any I don't really think there's there's kind of a twist but it's not that's not what the movie hinges on which is interesting because I just from the trailer, again, my expectation is, oh, maybe there's some kind of twist in this or a reveal. Mm-hmm. And that's not what this really does. Yeah. So they get to the island. They get a tour of all the facilities. This is a food biome where they're growing. Yeah, it's a, a biome of, of culinary ideas. Which yeah. Food or as Anya says. Taylor-Joy says, it's the base camp of Mount Bullshit. Yeah. Which I, I love. Around here I wrote for I can't wait for everyone to die. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the the tour includes, like we mentioned earlier, the very cult-like bunker that all the employees sleep in, which is separate from the cottage that Chef has. To I live in. after we saw the bunker and the, we we're getting the tour of the island, I wrote down that it reminded me of the Wicker Man. Yes, a little bit. Just this con- self-contained island where it's its own kind of ecosystem. Because in the Wicker Man, they talk a lot about the food that they grow there and mm. like the nature of that island is really important to the story and. They they have kind of this Lord Summer Isle who lives in his own little fancy house. And mm-hmm. that reminded me of Chef's house in this. Well, it's interesting, too, that you guys are mentioning stuff like Wicker Man and Midsummer and yeah. other kind of like Northern European mm-hmm. Nordic stuff. Yeah, yeah, because I think that this is this is very much referencing a restaurant in Copenhagen called Noma, which um, relocated recently to a kind of like more in the outside of the city, like boggy kind of you know, very, it's it's Copenhagen, Denmark, it's very Nordic, you know, and like that style, I think, really influenced this movie and the style of what um, Hawthorne is. Like, you should Google Noma and like, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that's obviously what it is. And they're, they're a very like influential fine dining restaurant for the last like decade. And they were best restaurant in the world last year, two years ago. Um I think also a couple, also three or four years ago. Uh, and like that kind of Nordic, new Nordic cuisine, like hyper local stuff like that is all very much part of what Chef is doing in this movie and like the culinary gardens and everything is on premises. They even and, say like, Nordic smokehouse. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very, yeah, very much. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it, but that then feeds, I love the way that that then feeds into the horror aspects with the kind of like folk horror and stuff like that. It, it The way that it all works together, I I, I, I mean, like the smokehouse itself is, is reminiscent of a, a location in Midsummer. Yeah. You know, where it does the, remind the, me of that. Uh, was it the Viking Eagle or whatever? Oh, it's yeah, like, the, the Blood Eagle. Yeah. They do a Blood Eagle in Midsummer? Yeah, they do. Dude, you gotta that see that Midsummer, man. Up, dude, it yeah. rules. No, I watched The Kill Count and it scared me. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. That movie scares me. Speaking of Midsummer, it's weird. The the music in this movie, I was thinking, oh, it kind of reminds me of Midsummer. The composer Intr- did. He did not do Midsummer. He did Hereditary, yep. but it's still that kind of Ari Aster, ethereal, slightly off. That I'm glad you brought up the music because that was something I wrote down right away. I is the love music, the music in, in this. the in the opening scene, uh, completely shifted my expectations for the movie because we're going into this. It's a horror movie. It's got some comedy. I'm thinking like Ready or Not. Uh, the the opening scene's music is very jaunty and like adventurous, mm-hmm. and it just it put me in a different headspace. It made it made it feel lighter to mm-hmm. me than something where I'm I was like dreading the stuff that was coming and like dreading in a good way of like oh this is gonna be like heavy or like distressful to watch. It it completely changed my perspective on this movie going into it. I was like oh is this gonna be like a fun time? And it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, just like just off the bat, just from that music, that was enough for me. Oh, I, I I love the way that that mirrors the meal because like uh, the way that the music kind of brought you in like that and, and to hear you describe it as lighter is what Namuz does. Mm-hmm. Like that that's the point of that. The early part of the meal is is to kind of make it feel fun and not be too heavy and not weigh you down and. It's just so interesting the way that they're able to make all these different elements of the movie fit that theme and all come together. Like, how many times does chefs say, like, it's all part of the menu? Yeah. yeah. You know? Uh, so, yeah, they get there to the restaurant, which is a very uh, very large window overlooking some water. Yeah. It's, like, it's on this, like, kind of beach where there's all this driftwood and there's these really gorgeous shots of all this, like these like huge driftwood pieces on this beach and it's kind of I'm trying to think of what it reminds me of i don't know it's cool it's almost like alien landscapey mm-hmm. i really like it all the shots of the nature here tyler which is nicholas holt's character he's just real excited to be there he's uh talking to the sous chef but not getting asking for his name as andy taylor joy notes yeah she points out why didn't you ask that guy his name because i think because the, the sous chef knows Tyler's name. Mm-hmm. And yeah. They know everything about They know everything customers. about. Yes, yes, exactly. What's the amuse bouche? It's uh, a, a, a Isn't it literally bouche? mouth that... fun? Yeah. It's what? Mouth, mouth fun? Like mouth. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. like, yeah. It's cucumber melon. 
This is like oh yeah, it's like it those little balls. fucking awesome. <laughs> it's like these little com- like it's like cucumber melon balls. It looks yeah. it's the most normal thing they get served. I think. Uh, that or the the scallop is pretty normal. Yeah, I was about to say they're like the first. It's on a big rock. It's fish. on rocks and leaves. It's not leaves, but yeah, but it's a scallop. But melon balls I've heard of and had. But they're all tiny. They're like this big. Sure. <laughs> and the snow. Don't forget about oh, the yeah, snow. Oh, yeah, there's snow on it. Tyler's so excited about the snow. He has frozen, one of those machines. It was like frozen salt water, he said. I think it was. Where it was like as it melts. Yeah. It, yeah. But that's on the. That's the first course. Yeah. The. Uh, that's the scallop, right? Yeah. Oh, it has, it has oh, the oh, salt oh, oh. water that melts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so all these meals are introduced with these these on-screen titles that just become funnier and funnier as they go on. <laughs> yeah, it's these graphics that you guys pointed out is basically Chef's Table. Um, Which it, is referenced by name in this movie. Yeah. They say Chef's Table. And it's weird because yeah. even without having seen Chef's Table, I still got what it was doing. Because I think other food stuff does that. I mean, I think, of again, I just love Iron Chef so much. When they mm-hmm. do the final presentations in the Japanese versions it's always like the food on this black background and it's all just <laughs> like just the artistic uh like swooping camera and they always have the graphics with what it is it's I feel like that's just kind of I don't know I got I got what they were going for at least yeah yeah this is when Tyler is talking about like you said earlier how he admires chef because he works with the raw materials of life and death mm-hmm. and Andy Taylor Joy is like Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. Yeah, and it is a cool way to think of food as... Like, the idea of food as art is really interesting because art, we always kind of think of, or, like, there's that critique that, like, oh, well, art's not actually useful. Like, you know, we can all survive without art, or there's this idea that... It's not essential. Exactly. It's But food as art, it's, like... Food is one of the most essential things, but also it's an art. It also contrasts, you know, most art forms I think of have a sort of permanence to them. Not everything, Mm -hmm. you know, a play performance is obviously art and that's just a one-time thing. But, you know, books, movies, like that art is something you make and then it it stays around. Mm -hmm. Whereas food is something you make and then is consumed or if not consumed decomposes and uh they they say in this movie elsa says that chef part of his uh whole thing is the how ephemeral his meals are so that's why you're not supposed to take pictures of right it, no photos even tyler of your food. keeps taking pictures of him i just food photos never look great i think for most people unless you really know how to take a picture I just never see anyone's food on Instagram and think like that looks great. You're always taking food photos, but, you but I do how to not take post them pictures. on Instagram. No, you send them to. I the send food them chat. to my friends. <laughs> I bother them and them alone. <laughs> <laughs> do you, are you happy with the photos? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes they're not what I want, but that's mostly because I want to be better at plating. Mm-hmm. Like. I'm not Dominique Crenn. <laughs> Who is the chef, Who's consultant. The chef consultant for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That name came up in the credits and you were like, oh. Yeah, yeah, It's very. Uh, uh, I read in uh, uh, an interview um, with her that she uh, is now working with the production designer from this movie to redesign a restaurant. Wow. wow. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that's cool. What's her whole deal food wise? She is the only woman in the US to have three stars. Mm-hmm. Um, she was the first woman to get two. Uh, she's French. Um, she likes to introduce her dishes with poems. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the like really elaborate artistic plating is like one of her kind of hallmarks. Like like you know it, it make it totally makes sense that she's they brought her in for this because it's very the the kind of like big artistic plating and stuff is something that 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 she does. I would absolutely in a heartbeat eat at her restaurant if I could. It's in San Francisco. Do you think that the food in this movie, I'm curious how this script was written because if you bring on someone like that as a consultant, do you think the move or the food in this movie is a parody of itself? Or do you think that she was very genuinely thinking like, okay, if I was kind of designing this like meal, what would I do thematically here and what would be good? And, and the, 
stuff that she's putting together for this isn't like heightened in any way do you think it's no, like the, totally sincere the food's totally serious okay and and she talked about in the interview how like she loved the script when they sent it to her and really wanted to be a part of it um because of chef julian's character and and you know everything that he deals with and everything and then when they were working together on the restaurant um the restaurant part of the set and everything she was very involved in making sure that it functioned a certain way sure um and the like the production designers and and the art team went to a lot of restaurants to see how the kitchens functioned and like all of the uh the chefs being so close together is like it doesn't matter if it's mcdonald's or if it's french laundry they're right you're you're close together like that and um you know like she worked with uh, all the actors who who were cooking and with, with Ray Fines to make sure that like what they were doing was right for food and all of those dishes like totally like to me and I'm not an expert like I want to be like I I I'm I'm not Tyler <laughs> yeah. but but you know I'm I'm also not like a professional or anything but I love food and I'm an enthusiast um and uh you're a foodie I am a food yeah sure I'm a foodie <laughs> it, th this movie killed foodies yeah <laughs> um but Literally. like all of the food made sense to me like I would I would happily greedily eat up every single dish served in this movie including yeah. The unaccompanied accompaniments. Oh, which is sure. the next course. Second course is the breadless bread. Yes, which I love. It's this, it's a plate with uh, these little helpings of like sauces. Yeah, sauces, dips. And then there's a note on the plate in place of where bread would be that's like instead of, because what he prefaces he it speech. with like bread's been around for 12,000 years. Mm -hmm. And typically, even, you know, especially among the poor. Yeah. Um, it's the most accessible food and, you know, the poor throughout history often that's the only thing you, you, they can afford. Christianity give us this day our daily bread. It's like the staple for th the masses. It's this ultimately accessible food. But you here tonight are not the common man. The, yeah. So you don't get bread. And so he just serves them these little things of sauce. And the note on there says instead of bread, you uh, the bread that you would be eating what was it it was like a donation made to this foundation that is dedicated to preserving heirloom grains or something <laughs> i didn't catch that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah some of the tech bros ask for uh some bread they're like hey can we like they're like we get it all right we we get yeah we we get the whole thing can we just get some fucking bread yeah and elsa says no and she whispers into one of their ears you'll eat less than you desire and more than you deserve i love it and it's just it, it's it's because uh she's so professional most of the time and this is one of the the earlier times when she like Let's that facade slip it's intentionally good. a little scary. bit. It's scary. The She's way she very cold. Kisses it. Yeah. That to me was the first like great line of the movie. Yeah. yeah. And also like these tech bros are such a uh, uh, quintessentially awful customer because they literally say, don't you know who we are? Right. And they're trying to push around the money because they work for the company that funds this restaurant. Yes, they work for the investor. I forget yes. the guy's name. Uh, it is uh, Doug Barrick. Yeah. The angel investor. Yes. Yeah, so is that he... a term? No. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah, for sure. An it angel sounded investor? like it was an actual term. Yeah. The oh, way okay. They used it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, who kept them open through COVID? <laughs> right. It was so fucking funny. <laughs> it's during this course too that the food critic points out. Um, she's like, "Oh, this emulsion is is broken. It's, it's what does that mean? A broken split? emulsion? It's like yeah, the oil, the oil and the fat it, have right? split. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's it split. Yeah, it's very obvious when you see it. And uh. The emulsion on her plate did not look broken. It, did. it didn't look broken to me, and I don't even know what the fuck I'm but looking at. But she's like, oh, you just, you know, this is not something that, you know, should be in a, in a place such as this, blah, 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 blah. And the everyone's hearing in this place is crazy. They can hear, they're like hawks. And sure enough, a couple minutes later, Elsa comes back out with this giant bowl of emulsion. Like, here's some more broken emulsion for you. Yeah, and the way, the way she, you know, presents it as though it is a dish... That the food critic asked for. You right. Know, and here's, so some, here's some broken emulsion. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Our first sponsor this week is NordVPN. You know how you go on a website to try and download an extension or some new software and there's like 
10 different download buttons, and you have to play this incredibly dangerous game where you hope you click the right button, the button that gives you your download and doesn't send all your personal information to a ring of elite hackers who are just sitting there waiting to ruin your life. At least, that's how I imagine it. This kind of trickery falls under the umbrella of malvertising. Something can disguise itself as an advertisement, and when you click it, your computer sends your device information to a bad party destination, and then the signal travels back with automatically picked malware to potentially infect your device. Our sponsor NordVPN is here to protect your information from malicious sites, downloads, and trackers. With NordVPN, all your internet data stays safe behind a wall of next-generation encryption. It'll also block malware and annoying ads. Imagine an internet without annoying ads. And NordVPN offers support 24-7. If you have questions or need help, their team of experts is right there to help you. I personally find having a team of people to talk to makes setting something like this up so much less overwhelming. Right now, you can actually get a huge discount on a two-year plan of NordVPN, plus four free additional months when you use our custom link at nordvpn.com slash deadmeat. It's totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash deadmeat, or click the link in the description below. One more time, that's nordvpn.com slash deadmeat. Our next sponsor this week is Bond Charge, and you know what that means. It's this super cute picture of James all snuggled up in bed wearing Bond Charge's blackout sleep mask again, at least if you're watching the video version of the podcast. He's got all the lights on in this picture, and it doesn't even matter because these masks are incredible at blocking out light. Unlike this picture, however, James usually sleeps on his stomach. He's a tummy sleeper. Other sleep masks aren't great for stomach sleepers, but Bond Charge's masks have an adjustable strap for perfect fit and adjustable eye cups that work for all sleeping styles. And on top of that, they're super, super soft. I hate when other sleep masks are really rough on the skin around my eyes, which is some of the most delicate skin on your body. Besides sleep masks, Bond Charge offers a wide range of products to help optimize your life in every way. Bond Charge products help you naturally address the issues of our modern day life effortlessly and with maximum impact. They ship worldwide in record time from Australia, which is where their sleep masks are designed. If you want to upgrade your sleep, you can go to bondcharge.com slash deadmeat and use the coupon code deadmeat to save 20%. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash deadmeat. Use the coupon code deadmeat to save 20%. Oh yeah, and then also there's this old lady here. We don't really know who she is at first. Just kind of yeah, she's just there drinking it up in the she hasn't the corner. Said a word. And it's during the third course that we find out that that is Chef Julian's uh, mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says that you know she's his mom. Uh, alcoholic. Alcoholic, just like his dad used to be. And uh, they they had Taco Tuesdays were their family tradition yep. and that during a particularly drunk taco Tuesday, the dad started attacking the mom. So he stabbed his dad in the thigh with a pair of scissors leading into the third dish, which is chicken thigh with tiny little scissors. With these little them. sewing scissors yeah. kind of put in it. And yeah, the dishes, it's called memory. Yes. And they are tortillas. Yeah. Tortillas. <laughs> <laughs> Printed with laser printing of Things that are made to upset the customers. Oh my gosh, these, the laser printed tortillas reminds me of those like espresso printers where they can put images on it. It's the the laser printing thing. I feel so gimmicky to me. Is that something people use in like No, them? they had to figure out how to do this. Really? Yeah, this was something where uh, they had to figure out how to get the laser to print the image on a tortilla without compromising the tortilla. So oh that's another like Dominique they... Crenn thing where it was like, but the tortilla has to be a tortilla. Interesting. They, they couldn't fake it for the I was about to say no, they didn't try to figure out how it. to do it. And oh, they, wow. And they did. Jeez. And it, I thought they looked awesome. See, that's the thing is, even as a non-food uh, literate person, I drink more protein shake than anything else these days. <laughs> that's why you wear your taco, your Baja Oh, yeah, this Blastoise. is my foodie shirt. This Baja Blastoise. Is Baja Blastoise. That's... Oh, no, I have shirts from Rustic Canyon I should have worn. <laughs> one is one has a pork chop on it, and it's heavy metal lettering. Amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah, you could have worn, like, the dead meat shirt with the meat on yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, I should have. But even as someone who doesn't know the ins and outs of this world it was so clear to me how authentic it was yeah. between the language being used and just the actions that even the uh the background actors playing the other chefs were doing and just the layout and and all that felt so authentic even though i couldn't say specifically what they were referencing or if those dishes 
were accurate. It just clearly they they are. Like, mm-hmm. they're not just bullshitting through because they thought of a funny premise of, like, oh, what if, like, a fancy restaurant? No, like, they did the work with the the chef consultant and everything, clearly. And, and like, that's what makes a good movie to me. Mm-hmm. Or what makes a great movie to me is when you, you when you don't just rest on the premise. Like, uh, I don't know. I'm not I was like, it was like, ooh, who are you going to throw under the bus? Yeah, going to dunk on someone. Um. <laughs> yeah, like, like we're a couple, cor- a couple courses from now, uh, not to jump ahead but the descri- when they do the title card with the description of the uh of the feminist course um, yeah oh man's folly Ma- man's mm-hmm. folly mm-hmm. i like literally reacted and went ooh like it just it sounded delicious yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like it's like not only is that something where you kind of have to think okay maybe people will be watching this who do know what they're looking at and do know what they're talking about but there's there is always this kind of intangible quality. It's so weird how you just instinctually kind of feel if something is well researched or has an air of sincerity to it. Like if it was all just one big jokey joke and they didn't do this kind of you know, where they had a, a consultant come on. It just wouldn't, I, I don't know. It's weird. It just, I can't put my finger on like what I would call that, but you just kind of know. Yeah. It's like a gut feeling. I feel like that's more common nowadays. I feel like in the 80s, if this movie was made, it would be very perfunctory. You would just use, get this premise as a framing device and then you would uh, do a save the cat run through of the script It would just like the most- Make up some weird dishes. Yeah. It's kind of like, I wonder, I think of like all the dishes in American Psycho. Like they, they go to all those restaurants <laughs> oh, yeah. and I Dorcia, wonder, right? I wonder yeah. how much, yeah, Dorcia. I wonder how many of the dishes in that movie are like, cause 80s cooking looks completely different. <laughs> um, I don't know. I wonder how much of that was like, legit or how much of it is just them kind of doing a parody of what they think of as Mm -hmm. fancy food so the tortillas have um (laughs) for the tech bros it has their like tax return or or, um financial transfers and stuff stuff. it's it's tax haven stuff yeah and fake invoices and and they're getting real nervous and they ask elsa what is this and Mm -hmm. that's what she's like it's tortillas. tortillas. <laughs> God, yeah. that was funny. She refused. That was it's, one of the it's funniest great. fucking things that yeah. in the movie. And then they talk themselves into like, no, no, no it's cool because we're here and we work for this investor and it's cool. It's all within the network of, of you know, yeah. it's fine. Like they can't take we us can't. down without taking themselves down. So right. it's all right. Yeah. Like we're too big to fail. You know? Right, exactly. Uh, for John Leguizamo, it's um, a <laughs> still from his movie Calling Dr. Sunshine that he said, was uh, what he's he was like awful script and stuff but, but he had was, a blast he had a fun he liked time filming making it. it yeah that's why i'm like oh man i know that's why i ca- I, I like his character but weirdly <laughs> he said in an interview that he based his character off of steven seagal which steven seagal is a huge asshole yeah so i didn't get that at all i don't know maybe john leguizamo was he's just too likable yeah and, and- he's he's like refusing to let his assistant quit she's trying to quit because she got a job as a um uh, an associate development, development co-executive. I, I develop stuff. Yeah. So funny, <laughs> that funny. description of development it's was amazing. It's very real and very yeah. funny. And Much like, love a to our there. friends who work in development. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a future there. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, or a different future than he working He says for that he, he sabotaged uh, an opportunity with her at Sony. He put in a negative, uh, he <laughs> gave her a bad referral, which I think is so And funny. she's like, yeah, I know. You CC'd me on Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> Definitely unintentionally. That's why he needs her. The tortilla. Tia's uh, for the uh, older couple show that the guy with the younger woman. Mm-hmm. I know. I wanted to see everyone's tortillas. Like what was on the assistant's tortillas? Yeah. What was on the <clears throat> wife? It, it was one one uh, per table basket of tortillas oh, per table. Yeah. It was. yeah. And then okay. for the food critic, it was a bunch of uh, restaurants that closed after, after her she negative reviewed reviews. Them. Yeah. Um, Nicholas Holt, it's pictures of him from the pictures, night taking yeah. pictures of his food. He was like, I thought he wouldn't mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, fucking- Lots of things. You look back, lots of little moments where he thinks he's going to be able to get away with things that no one else can. Yeah. Like the rules don't apply to him. Yeah. And this is when he starts to openly get very... Um, He's testy. He the way he talks to Anya Taylor Joy, he it snaps at her. He yeah, he he snaps his fingers at her. He calls her like a stupid child or something. Her yeah. reaction to that is, "Did you just did you just snap fucking me? snap at me?" Love Fair. It. Like you need to apologize to me now. I love it. But that's when you start to be like, "What what's is what's their relationship? Is he just a really bad boyfriend or mm-hmm. what the hell's happening here?" And it all makes a lot more sense in retrospect. Yeah. But 
yeah. I love the snapping as a choice because like people who snap at waiters. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Like not asking the sous chef his name and people who snap, like the, the, the way that he represents not just like a certain type of like foodie culture person and stuff like that, but like just entitled diners yeah and all of them do yeah with the the tech bros being like do you know who i am Mm -hmm. like do do it according to me because i am better than you uh john leguizamo keeps saying that he's friends with the chef and like he's a name dropping it's like food as status Mm -hmm. same Um, thing with the older couple yeah or like and he's also he's developing a food travel show where he doesn't seem like he knows that much about anything about food yeah but it just he's like yeah it should it'll be easy i could do that whatever i in fact saw one reading of this as uh each table represented a deadly sin i saw that too i thought that was kind of interesting um uh let's see there's uh, Gluttony, which is the mom just drinking all the alcohol constantly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sloth. Sloth. Is that John Leguizamo? John Leguizamo just like lazily doing a a TV show Um, that he thinks will make him money. I love it when the assistant's like, that's what you're going to pitch to three streaming networks. Yeah. (laughs) Envy's Nicholas Holt. For sure. Wanting to be chef and chef's friend. Right. Uh, Lust is the the older older guy who's having an affair. Right. I'm trying Greed to... is the tech bros. Greed, Greed is the, the tech, tech bros, bros for sure. Wrath is just the chef. chef. Yep. Yeah. And what's the last one? Pride. 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 Oh, the, the food, food critic. critic. The food critic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought that. You know, I don't know if that was intentional. But... Uh, Liguizamo talked about that in an in interview that oh, yeah? that like there there was a seven deadly sins angle to things. I don't love that reading personally. I I, I find. Seven Deadly Sins as overdone. a device overdone. It's, a, it's sure. overdone, I think. Which, like, maybe that's a commentary in and of itself of, like, trends and, you know, like, because there's plenty of stuff in food that's overdone, but, like, I, I, think, I think it's mean, almost kind it's of fine. A, it's not my favorite reading. I think it's fine because it's, it's incidental. Almost. Yeah, 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 sure. I think also stuff like Seven Deadly Sins is a little bit like, um, what do you call it? Like a... Rorschach or like a horoscope where you can kind of force it yeah, to make yeah. it totally. fit if there's seven of anything. Mm-hmm. But I mean, even us were like, Wrath is a chef, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah, not right. one of the, the takers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that was seven, right? He, he, mm-hmm. Spacey was his own sin at the end. Oh, you're yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, he, he certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> um, chef is very upset about Anya Taylor Joy's presence. Because she's not eating the food. She did not eat the uh, the sauces for the lacking bread bread dish. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't supposed to be there. And well, he, supposed to be here today. She He keeps asking who she is. And she says, you know. I'm, I'm Margo. Yeah, he confronts Margo her in the bathroom. Nebraska. She goes to use the bathroom. And he yeah. walks in there. And he just he demands to know who she is. And later he's like, you're not a Margo. I've met Margos and you're not a Margo. Mm-hmm. Which I... I disagree. I think she seems like such a Margo, but maybe that's because when I think of movie Margos, I think of Gwyneth Paltrow in Royal Tenenbaums, and they have a similar kind of... Sure. Like... Uh, Ooh, Anya Taylor Joy in a Wes Anderson movie. It'll happen. Like, it's going to happen someday. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. If it was, like, 15 years ago, Tim Burton would have snatched her up so fast no burton you can't but i don't her. think he she would work with him no. at this point no he's done he's 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 good he's made good stuff yeah but can't have her he's living in the tv world right now which oh, is not what's he doing in the tv world? uh uh wednesday oh he he did wednesday yeah i've heard it's fun i've heard it's fun i mean just jenna ortega she's got i heard that she's fucking great yeah, yeah. The next meal's the mess. The mess, yeah. What did you say? The mess is kind of a, a not parody, but like a send up of something that exists. Well, at, when when we first got to the mess, I thought the mess was the Alenia reference. Oh, which is at the end. But that's, that's the, the s'mores, s'mores at the okay. end. Yeah, yeah. Sure. We'll which like that. this is still kind of like this big, large format thing. Which you know, like that was kind of that era of like the you know like er- early twenty teens, like you know, but. Um, yeah, I think I, I, this is the course that I think I've thought about more than any of the other ones since Mm -hmm. because of the way that it deals with like the mental health aspect of the industry Mm -hmm. and the like pressures on Sue's and like upcoming chefs to be a certain thing and cook a certain kind of food and like 
the idea of you have to be the next somebody or you have to replace somebody. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people, a lot of chefs just become the next chef at a restaurant. They don't necessarily open their own, mm -hmm. you know, and like this, especially in that really high end fine dining world, like that guy, you know, the Sioux will always be under the like the shadow of Julian. Like mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. like Grant Atkins from, from Alenia was worked at the French Laundry. Okay. And on the chef's table episode, he talks about how like when he was at the French Laundry, he made a dish and he talked to Thomas, the chef Thomas Keller about it. And and Keller said, if we put this on the menu, it's not a Grant Atkins dish. It's a Thomas Keller dish. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, really interesting when we're talking about like that stood out to me. And I was thinking about that w when we're talking about things like the mess and uh, man's folly, where these are the Sue's dishes. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about the Sue's. We're not talking about uh, Jeremy or God, I already forgot the character's name. Mm -hmm. Rachel or was that the Sue at a restaurant I, think, yeah, I just I went to like recently? Or something. Um, I don't know. You know, like. We're talking about these as designs of Julian, not right. as designs of the the other chefs who created the dishes. The 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 the, the uh, other Sue says it was her idea to kill everybody. Yep. Yeah, you know, and and we're not talking about them as their own agents. We're yeah. talking about them under the umbrella of Julian, and I think that that's like that's the part that's really stuck with me the most of like they're really saying something with this dish, and like the affection that Julian has. For for him before he does it and every mm -hmm. like i don't think that's fake i think that's real and like i don't know that this one it's the, it's weird, the most serious too yeah it's the weird like mentor student mm -hmm. thing of like it's i think like whiplash where it's just this toxic like there's a weird affection there but it's almost a possessiveness or oh, it's yeah. a I don't know. Yeah, just that kind of like you think it's love, but it's not really. It's just pure obsession. Yeah, of. and there are like really nasty personalities in that industry. I obviously, it. just like every other industry, but like you know, there there are famously nasty chefs, and you know, I I was worried that this movie was going to go in that direction where he was going to be a screamer mm -hmm. and like. You know, he was going to be the Gordon Ramsay character and right. like, you know, or what Gordon was when he was younger, or, you know, um, what other chefs are now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that's really come up in the last couple of years and like, you know, the food sphere and stuff is fighting against that mm -hmm. perception. And for this movie to address that in a very dramatic way, I really, really loved. I, 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 I think that this is, to me, the most crucial course yeah, yeah it's also the turning point story-wise it is this is like the full tilt we're going into the horror of the movie and it's interesting because you you said that like these two dishes made by the sous chefs are like it's their creations but weirdly they are kind of julian's creations because this the first chef, Jonathan, his no, whole- No, Jeremy. Or Jeremy. See, oh, no, R.I.P. Oh, my God. Jeremy. I did it. Oh, that's so, that's <laughs> right, so devastating. <laughs> um, You're another his Tyler. Whole, that whole sequence is based around his failure to live up to Julian's expectations. It's all about Julian. And yeah, like you mentioned, how is he going to live up to this chef? And then the, the woman later, the other sous chef, her whole thing, it's based around his sexual harassment of her. Mm -hmm. So we, it is like, yes, it is their ideas, but at the same time, it's still like stuff that they came up with as a result of working for Julian and just living with him, basically, and giving Catherine. their lives to him. Catherine, Catherine. Is the other sous chef, yes. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. And it's it's weird how, I mean, you see that in other areas of art too that's like the whole auteur thing in film like who really makes a film the you get this like star director thing and sometimes directors turn into that too where it's this like slavish devotion to one person's vision and if you make a decision on a film it ultimately still gets attributed to that yeah. director like is it uh Ari Aster's shots or is it his cinematographers right who you know? came up with these ideas how collaborative was it who wrote the joke in a comedy writer's room? Right. Yeah. 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 
Uh, but yeah, basically, uh, poor Jer- Jeremy. Yep. I don't like you wanting to call him Jonathan. <laughs> That's so bad. I would get so killed in this movie. <laughs> but maybe not, because I do like, I like burgers. <laughs> <laughs> that is how to survive. I like those how to survive YouTube videos. Oh, yeah. I'll hit them up. Get a cheeseburger. <laughs> oh, no. So yeah, his whole thing is this is the mess. They bring out like a piece of canvas, pretty much. What are they laying down on it? Lavender or sage? I think, yeah, like like different herbs and stuff. And yeah, basically, Chef just tells everyone, this is Jeremy. He will never be great. He's he's good, not great, ultimately. (laughs) And so, uh, yeah, Jeremy takes out a gun and shoots himself in the head. And Mm -hmm. everyone obviously is freaked out except for Nicholas Holt, who is still eating. Yeah. <laughs> and the critic starts just convincing herself, no, 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 like this is this is theater. This is all part, which to be fair, is what I think what I would start convincing myself happened as well, because that just is... The alternative is too much. It's too yeah. much. It just be like, no, 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 this, no, that's wild. It's clearly theater. If you're going to feel safe anywhere, it's going to be at one of these things where you just assume... Like, this is a very fancy, exclusive experience. It's yeah. safe. And yeah, why would anything bad happen here? I, yeah, they for a little while, they're not sure if it's real or not. I think everyone is fully convinced when uh, the guy gets his ring finger the cut off and when he tries his, to leave. Yeah, because yeah, he goes to, what is it? He he's, he's going to like make a call or something. He's like, I'm going to call a helicopter or something. Yeah. And also goes, with what hand? With what hand? No, no. He says, I'm going to handle this. And she says, with what hand? Oh, okay. This? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he doesn't pick. So she picks for him and they cut off his, his ring finger. Uh, and that's, I mean, even at that point, I think the critic is like, oh, I think this is all a show for us specifically. Like, yes, that's good this acting. This is for me. Like, she's still holding out. Because I was invited be here mm-hmm. by the chef. That's, she keeps going back to, like, I was personally asked to be here because he must think my opinion matters so much. Then uh, the chef goes and talks to Margot again. I think he asks her basically to, like, either come back to his office or they have, like, another private conversation where he's like, oh, yeah, no, everyone here is dying tonight. Yeah. And e- everyone, everyone's yes, chef. Die. Everyone says it. Yeah. yeah. And you have a choice now because you aren't supposed to be here. So I need to figure out where you belong. Are you going to die with the diners or are you going to die with us? The well, staff? because he says that he recognizes that she's not one of them. Yep. That she is uh, more like them, a service industry person. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, we can, we can just say, because like all the scenes are like back and forth. Kinda. It's a lot of back and forth. Yeah, yeah. But so eventually it's revealed that she is a, a sex worker. Mm-hmm. who is there who Nicholas Holt hired to take with him because uh his girlfriend broke up with him and he knows that you can't go here by yourself so he needed a plus one and so he hired a sex worker to uh not only come with him but also look him in the eye and call him a good man and say she was his daughter no that, no, that was the that was man. the old man that's how she oh, knew the old man that's how she knew the old oh, man oh i'm yeah. sorry okay so the old man uh apparently paid her previously that's how right. she knows him to look her look him in the eye while he jerked off while he jerked off yeah. and say he was a good man and she was his daughter right okay yeah and it's interesting their conversation here is is neat because this could go one way but it goes another and i think it's pleasantly surprising where they talk about how they both essentially work in service like he is a chef and she is a sex worker they provide an experience for people and he asks her like do you enjoy what you do? And she says, I used to, which I think is really interesting. This is a character that you don't get to see very often with the exception of something like Cam, which was a movie made by sex workers. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that it was was kind of uh, portrayed in this way where... This character is never like, I had to do it. Yeah. I maybe had no other choice. It seems like it's something she at some point liked doing. She liked providing these experiences for people and it's like hospitality to her, um, which I think is is neat. So there, she's in a similar situation to Chef where he says, yeah, this I used to like cooking for people, but I haven't in a very long time. Yeah, they but both say that. I, I like that this movie doesn't once look down on her for what she does. It's just her job and it's something that, I don't know. Like and, she, and they're providing the two most basic human services, sex and food. food yeah. They're very physical, very taste-based. Very, like very carnal. ancient. Yes. 
I mean, yeah, he's the talk- world's oldest world's profession. Oldest profession. Well, yeah. I mean, when he's talking about bread and how bread has been around for 12,000 years, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, kind of a joke saying, but it's like, yeah, the world's oldest profession. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's also very intentional. And then when that revelation happens, you just think back to all the interactions between Nicholas Holt and her, and it makes so much sense that they're not just a a couple who have different tastes. He mm-hmm. has hired her to come with him. And so when he tells her to stop smoking, she does because he is paying her. And she's lo- she says, you're the one paying in the beginning. And you think, oh, he's paying for the experience. Yeah, but also, yeah. no, he's the one paying her to be there with him. And that's an interesting thing too, because at first when you think maybe she's his girlfriend or something, you're like, okay, I guess I could see... You know, if I'm bringing someone with me who is like a loved one that I'm like, no, no, I, I'm, this is something that means a lot to me. I want you to experience it to the fullest. If you smoke before this, it won't, but like, he doesn't know her and theoretically he shouldn't really care, but he's just so obsessed with food and this whole thing that it's like, no, you have to enjoy this the way that I insist you enjoy it, even though it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really fucking matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really isn't going to matter. And he knows it too. That's the thing. The other revelation is that Nicholas Holt knew that everyone is supposed to die at the end. That comes later during Tyler's bullshit. It does, bullshit. yeah. It's during... I, I want to talk about Tyler when we get yeah. to Tyler's yeah. bullshit. I mean, we're we're getting there. Is, oh, this is around when they move outside, too, I think. Yeah, this, is this man's folly? Man's folly, Where yes. the other sous chef, Catherine, talks about how, yeah, uh, chef was harassing her and she kept having to rebuff him and then he like cold shouldered her in the kitchen which sounds like a very real life yeah thing that would happen he he didn't fire her but just kind of treated her like shit in the kitchen wouldn't talk to her or look at her directly right she says i think if i remember right she says tried to fuck me Yeah. yeah yeah which i like the explicit nature of the way she describes it i think was very intentional and great because mm-hmm. it wasn't like harassed me or whatever like you know no there, mm-hmm. around the bush yeah, yeah there's yeah. a there's a very like visceral way you know and again how everything ties together like you know the language used is very intentional just as all the food choices are intentional yeah yeah so then she is given a pair of scissors and she stabs chef in the leg just like he stabbed his father in the leg at that dinner when mm-hmm. he was a kid and i then- loved the way that um this scene where when chef is stabbed contrasts with uh the guy getting his finger cut off because that guy whimpers for like 15 minutes mm-hmm. yeah he's crying he's like, crying wailing. in the background yeah. and when chef is stabbed or when any of the other um uh, you know, kitchen staff are. Yeah, they you know, feel nothing. They feel nothing, and and he like, talks about that with his hands. Yeah, with later. his hands. Yeah, asbestos hands. Yeah, he, literally lost sense of. Yeah, touch like they're he can pick up a hot pan, which we see. Uh, when Nicholas Holt is trying to cook, he keeps burning himself. He can't, oh yeah, he can't pick anything up because it's too hot, which shows like he is not a practiced mm-hmm. cook. His hands at aren't. All. Yeah, calloused and, and <laughs> yeah. Hardened for um, it. So this is when uh, he tells all the male diners that he's going to give them a 45 second head start and they're all going to run and then the staff is going to try and catch them. And that one guy just takes off. It feels very, that felt very Wes Anderson to me. Yeah. The like have... wide shot of that dude just running. Yeah, one of the tech bros. <laughs> yeah. This is a great sequence uh, where the men all take off <laughs> and Nicholas Holt does not. And Chef has to be like, you too. You too. It, so here, I want to talk about Nicholas Hole. I want to talk about Tyler. And we'll get to Tyler's bullshit. But uh, some people online I saw were questioning why he would come here, even though he was told ahead of time that everyone would be killed. And some people said, well, he's so, he's so obsessed with food and this whole experience that it was worth it to him. I think maybe, but I also think that part of him thinks that It won't happen to him. I think that's the case, too. I don't think he thought he was going to die. He's such an entitled character to me between, I mean, right off the bat, they say, do not take pictures of this food. And he's immediately taking pictures of that. And people were like, why do you think he's taking pictures of them when he knows they're all going to die at the end? And I'm like, because I don't think he thinks he's going to die. That's why when they all take off running, he just stands there like, ha, these idiots. And he has to be prompted into doing it. And then doesn't he just hide like under the staircase right there. Like he doesn't even run. Mm -hmm. He's just like shown to have just done the perfunctory bare minimus, bare minimum of hiding. Yeah. Uh, So yeah, I think that he's just an entitled 
guy who thinks like, oh yeah, sure, they'll kill everyone, but not me. Me and Chef are cool. Like, yeah, he's like, and beyond, um, I think food, this movie has to do a lot with like how like fandom and uh, like consumption of art in general. And that character feels to me like someone who uh, is convinced that they enjoy art the correct way and they enjoy it the most and that makes them a better fan than everyone else because they they get it the most you mm -hmm. know you see this at like if you go to a q a like after a movie someone will inevitably raise their hand and think that whatever they have to contribute is the like is going to blow everyone's minds like the director of that movie is going to be like yes you are the the one true fan in this room you get it <laughs> You, you know, your your comment instead of a question was so necessary. And I'm so glad, you, you know, like people, I, he's that person who mm. thinks that like he is going to enjoy the food and the experience so correctly that he's not going to die because of course not. That's, I, yeah. I can't wait to rewatch this movie and just watch Tyler. I know. Because, like there's so much in like... To me, my reading of him is that he is somebody who uh, desperately, desperately wants to be liked. Yeah. And like, because there's the comments about uh, early on when they're on the dock about how he didn't go to prom and like mm -hmm. he, none of the cool girls would go out with him. And now he's with the coolest girl. And like he, she, he calls her the coolest girl a couple times. And like, you know, he, he sits in the back and he wants to, he's like... There's, there's just subtle things that suggest that, like, he at one time was the kind of person um, that nobody paid any attention to. Mm -hmm. And now he's out on social media being this foodie, taking these pictures, presumably posting these pictures on social media, to try to get that clout. And it's, like, I agree with you, Chelsea, that, like, he does think that he's better than this. And mm -hmm. he, he, he thinks that he... Um, he can overcome being that person that nobody likes. And now he is the person that everybody likes. And why wouldn't you like him? Because he's like, he's handsome and he's funny. And like, you know, he's all these things that these pe these people do to try to cover themselves in this false persona. But, you know, they present something outward that isn't true. The food is ephemeral. Your picture is bullshit, mm -hmm. you know, and like and he's he he's a poser. I mean, like, but I bet he's the person who thinks like my food photos look good. Oh, yeah. 100%. Everyone else's food photos look bad, but mine are good. And they're the ones people are going to see on Instagram and be like, wow, that looks amazing. That top down angle does not look good. It never. <laughs> yeah, it's never going to look great. No. Yeah. There's a reason that I like uh, food and stuff you see in print ads and commercials is like. 50% not food. Yeah. Yeah. There's food stylists. <laughs> yeah. That's a job. It's such a dream. I, dude, I how I don't know how you get into that profession, but I remember reading about that job. I think there was an there was an issue of Nickelodeon magazine where they, they had uh like a food stylist talk about how they and I just was so my my world just <laughs> I don't know. That's in in like if I, I ever decided it with like a, a uh, viscous liquid yeah, like, yeah, water, yeah, yeah. like I just a simple think, syrup or something mm -hmm. instead. If of... I ever have like a midlife crisis, I'm gonna end up being a, a like a food stylist where I'm <laughs> turning like mashed potatoes into ice cream so it doesn't yeah. melt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the funny scene with the the people running and hiding because you think yeah they're gonna find them and kill them. Right. They're not. They're just catching them. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> the last guy is uh, Ted, the uh, the magazine editor who's hiding in the chicken coop. <laughs> And it's what is it? Yeah, he says especially uh there you see an arm of one of the uh the chefs or the cooks. What do you like the staff? Yeah, yeah, one of the other chefs, one, one of the, the under Yeah, they chefs, like yeah. stick their arm in this chicken coop and they go, A special bite for the last guest to be caught. The, the <laughs> best joke in the movie is it the little is jiggle. So funny. Yeah, and he, he eats it. Another too. line that I love during this scene that I haven't seen enough people uh give proper appreciation to is when they're it's the women are are eating the sous chef's uh actual food that she prepared and <laughs> She's like crying and because she doesn't feel appreciated and all the women are like, no, no, no. You're like, oh, this is so good. And then the assistant goes, it's, it's the, it's the emoji, emoji for, for me. me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the way her delivery funny. is just really, really funny. Yeah. That's a great moment where when the men are out running around the women around the table and mm -hmm. they're trying to. That's one of my favorite scenes. I, I love it because they're like trying to coax this sous chef into letting them go. And the sous chef's like, no, it was my idea. It was to my kill idea everyone. to have everyone die. Fuck. <laughs> she says, I was really proud of it. Yeah. yeah. Which like, that's just it's seeking 
chef's approval. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, we've all been in that position with a boss or a mentor or whatever, where it's like you just want so badly, you know, to please them mm-hmm. and to to get that that you know those kudos and everything like like i remember when i when i when i when i wrote like psas for pbs and i would turn in scripts and it'd be like one line would be changed but Mm -hmm. that one line was like damn it it's better yeah and like and it you know it does it drives you nuts and like yeah you know i can definitely see that like Mm -hmm. oh i was really proud that he liked my pitch and then like when you do get that approval like i still ride on the high that I felt when I was interning I was like 20 <laughs> interning on a George Clooney movie and I made some shit cause I was in the art department and he called the office and told the coordinator hey you have to tell whoever made these things for the set that these are like fantastic and we're, <laughs> we're putting them in the shot and I just wanted them to know they're really good that's Dude, awesome I that is a cherished memory of mine. It, that's real though. That like that shit like triggers like a very real chemical feeling in your brain. Mm-hmm. Especially if it's someone you look up. I mean, it's George fucking Clooney. You know, that's a celebrity. Like, and this guy in the movie is a celebrity chef. Yeah. If you you know approval at the cost of we're all gonna die. You know, maybe that's worth it to these people. Oh, we forgot that the investor gets dunked underwater and drowned. Oh my God, did we skip that whole thing? Yeah, that was earlier. It was uh, the chef, chef shows them a demonstration of uh, the angel investor with angel wings hanging from like some ropes, getting lowered into the, the water until he drowns. Yeah. And uh, that was when with the he kept you open through COVID thing. Yeah, he makes them <laughs> listen and then there's silence and he says the silence means I'm free. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, he, what was he saying? He was like, he kept trying to change dishes and mm-hmm. kept trying to have his input. So th- he would ask for substitutions. Yes, and he goes, and there there's are no, no substitutions. substitutions. It's it's uh that scene and that angle speak to the movie's theme of art being commodified yeah. and the commercialization of art and suits. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh Obviously, this is about food as art, but I think there's a lot of crossover to film as art where you get the money people making the decisions and the input and changing the artistic direction and integrity of the final product. Mm -hmm. And they feel the uh, authority to do that and the entitlement to because they provided the money for it. It's the same thing with the the tech bros who work for that company saying like, no, you have to serve us Mm -hmm. the way we want because we are in like indirectly funding you we are paying for this it does truly make you question how much art do you encounter on a daily basis that is pure art that is not driven by profit Mm -hmm. that is not meddled with by other people that is just someone just purely expressing themselves without they're not trying to sell it they're not yeah mad god (laughs) honestly that's why mad god is a fucking masterpiece because Mad God was not beholden to anyone except Phil Tippett. Mm -hmm. And that's why something like that is so fucking cool to just witness, you know? Chelsea again pausing the episode. Quite literally the day after we recorded this, Phil Tippett's team reached out to us and Phil is now the next episode of the podcast. It's truly a weird, awesome coincidence, and I can't wait. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot more about art as pure expression, the conflicts between money and art, and how come there's so much poop in Mad God. Be sure to tune in. Okay, back to the review. Like, it's so rare that you get to see art like that, and when you kind of stop and think about it, it it is trippy how... Uh, especially the more expensive a medium becomes, like film or, yeah. Yeah, because you need that money. Yeah, like a, a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Right, that's, I don't know. Do you think there's like such thing as a restaurant where it is just pure, like, this is exactly what I want to be doing? I think it's possible. I think that those definitely exist. And I think that's what a lot of chefs, like the kind of people that Julian represents, want, mm-hmm. you know? But the money, the margins are so tight. It's impossible to make money on a restaurant. Like, mm-hmm. and... But I do think that that can exist in food, not necessarily in fine dining where you need to have these like, you know, incredible spaces and everything to justify these costs. But like there's a lot of really excellent, you know, mid lower level restaurants, even like, you know, street carts and food trucks and Mm -hmm. stuff where people are doing unbelievable things and they're just trying to feed people. Yeah. And, And like that's. That's when food is really beautiful and really something that's amazing because like we all do, they talk about it a little bit in the movie, like we all eat, mm-hmm. we all have to eat. Um, and when you're sharing something 
with when you're a giver, mm-hmm. you know, that does exist and and that's it's rare but it's beautiful. Like just like any other art form. It's yeah. it's rare but it's beautiful. Honestly, that's what fucking drives me nuts about the ultra rich like Elon Musk and people of that level of they could make a movie or whatever exactly how they wanted to if they wanted to they could make stuff just to their liking without being bound by like the financial restrictions they're they're not creative people but they don't do anything near those people's lives are devoid of art it it kills me we're like trying to fucking scrounge up money to make a a fun little horror comedy like Elon Musk could make a million of these movies without blinking a goddamn eye yeah it's just it's it's a certain personality type to get that wealthy, and it's not the personality type that creates. Um, is yeah. Who do you think the richest creative is? Lucas Spielberg. Mm, Lucas, Lucas or is... Spielberg? Lucas got that merchandise. Yeah. Not anymore. I think he signed it all away, didn't he? To Disney. Did he sign away the merch rights? No way. He gave he away a lot of that money. I don't think he cares about it anymore. The way that it's got to be Spielberg though. Like he owns those. companies know, but... and shit. Like a, or are you talking about like filmmaker? I'm talking about any creative. Rihanna, people who, people Rihanna who are actually is a artists. Rihanna, Rihanna is a billionaire. Rihanna's a billionaire, yeah. What? How? Because she, she has, owns companies and shit. Yeah, like like Fenty. She's really and, smart. Yeah, okay. she's yeah. Because mm-hmm. like like with Oprah, I don't know if I'd call her a creative. As, Not in the same way. No, no. she's like a business person yeah. and host. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I guess let's get to Tyler's bullshit. It's Tyler's bullshit time. Oh my god! Please rise for the demonstration. Please rise to observe a demonstration. Yeah. So what happens is is Chef says, "Okay, look, there's still an unresolved matter of why Tyler is here," and that's when it's revealed that Tyler knew this whole time mm-hmm. that everyone's gonna die. Margot lunges across the table. And Emma, or no, I'm Aaron. Sorry, Aaron. Yeah, her real name is Aaron. Yeah. That we we learned it's her real name. Mm-hmm. Chef asks Tyler to come to the front, and he's like, "You're not like the others," and and kind of talks him up and <laughs> gives him a little a little uh, chef's jacket. Is there a name for that? Chef's coat. Okay, so the chef's he coat. Writes his name on and it, and he writes his name. The way he writes it, it just it, it just looks, looks like, like a, a little kid. It lo- yeah. Yes, it looks like it's his first day at school. And or it's something. the lines that you have to like match as you learn to draw yeah, the letters. Yeah, e, Tyler, and then <laughs> the period. period. Yep. <sighs> and he's like, you, you know what? You're you're a cook. You belong in the kitchen. And then he demands that he cook. And Gressel shrivels into a tiny worm. Oh my gosh! I it's- died. I, I I melted into that chair. This was the most this was the most uncomfortable scene I've seen in a movie in recent memory. I, I cannot think of anything that has made me more physically mortified. It's than pretty this scene. nuclear cringe. And like, I mean, this is this movie's made by a lot of people who work on succession, yes, so that yep. makes complete sense. That show yeah, has Yeah, it would be Kendall's rap. Yes, Kendall's rap <laughs> is another just my soul leaving my body because I'm just so Chef's comments while he's fucking cooking this oh, up. Oh yeah. So he goes, Oh funny. yeah, because cause he's like, um, okay, I need shallots. Oh shallots for the great foodie. <laughs> yeah. Like just dr- leeks and shallots. How interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a, a, a new, new dicing, dicing technique. Yeah. yeah. Oh of which we were previously unaware. <laughs> um yeah, so he makes what it's like lamb Undercooked shanks lamb. in butter with leeks and shallots. What um? Do you think there will ever be a uh? Is it binging with Babish? He re- recreates. I, I, oh, for I, sure. I, yeah, he'll do Tyler's he bullshit. Has to. Yeah, I hold. He, Either that that's or the, the burger. One, yeah, he could do the burger. He could do Tyler's bullshit. Ooh, I'll hit him up because we're we're cousin channels. Oh God, you that's should. That's right. We sh- you should collaborate yeah, on Tyler's, Tyler's bullshit. bullshit. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. and see what it actually would taste like. <laughs> Andrew, come to L.A. <laughs> <laughs> I bet to my big fan here. <laughs> unsophisticated palate, I'd be like, this is. Okay. It looks very undercooked. Yeah, yeah. But I hate undercooked lamb. Yeah. Yeah. But uh other than that, like if it was made right, I would I feel like there's no sure. he didn't put any like spices or anything. It That's just true. was like meat and butter. And it, yeah, it would <laughs> Um and it's just devastating. He tries it and at first he his face looks like I'm getting it. Maybe it's good. And and Tyler's like, holy fuck, did I actually pull this off? And no, he says it's fucking terrible. Um, you, he says, you're why the mystery has been drained from our art. Mm-hmm. And he then whispers something in Tyler's ear. And Tyler takes Just off takes his off jacket, takes off his tie. And I'm like, there it is. And then shortly thereafter, he is found hanging. Yeah. Uh, so maybe he did know that everyone was going to die because he killed himself pretty fast. But I like to think... 
that it was just the complete devastation from Chef's disappointment that caused him to do I that. I want to believe that it was up until that moment, he still didn't think he was going to die with all of them. And then Chef said something to the effect of like, you're going to die with all of us tonight, but or like, you're going to die tonight, but you're not going to die with us. Like, just go, you know, kill yourself now. Like, just. Yeah, I wonder, not- I wonder with this movie, I bet the writer or the director have an idea of what. I I, I think so. But yeah. I, I would guess it's something to that effect. Like, no, you're going to die here, but you don't even deserve to. You're not getting dessert. You've been a naughty <laughs> yeah. boy and you're not getting dessert. I would love to know, to talk to Nicholas Hull about this character because like, I know I, too. my feeling is that he deeply hates himself. Yeah. And, yeah. And has through the whole run of the movie and that this is, this is the last straw. And this is, this is confirmation that everything he already feels about himself is true. Yeah. And nobody, yeah. nobody likes him. Mm-hmm. He has no chance to, to impress his idol and he failed on the biggest stage that he has ever had. Yeah. And like, it, oh God, that, oh man. I want to interview him. We, we almost got to interview Nicholas Holt, but scheduling happened. Mm-hmm. It was for Renfield. Um, but maybe oh, yeah, right. since it's coming out soon, it's our other chance. Because that was going to be a set visit. That's right. But now In since New it's Orleans, yeah. coming out soon. We'll probably do a junket. Oh, God, too. I just really like him. Ask him what he said. Yeah. <laughs> What or if it's uh, a secret. what made you cringe so hard, Gressel, about this? Is it the thought of someone asking you to, oh, you're such a good cook, cook me something? Yeah, like there's so many layers of of why this is horrible for me. Like, like I, 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 as a home cook, the idea of hey, make me something is is horrifying. It's like asking com- a comedian to tell a joke. Yeah, yeah, you know, and like being put in a professional kitchen like that is an absolute fucking nightmare. Like I I love I love food, I love cooking, I love restaurants. I respect the hell out of staff. I have in the past worked in restaurants, nothing fine dining, nothing like this, but I would never never deign to pretend that I'm a professional, but being put on the spot like that and saying come back and cook me something and then cooking something and then serving it to the chef mm-hmm. is is horrifying like i think about food shows sometimes like oh should i apply to a food show or whatever but like then fucking like brooke williamson or somebody is like eating your food and like that sucks yeah like (laughs) it's like ted from queer eye for the straight guy just yeah yeah being devastated that you couldn't do more with the ingredients he gave you on chopped right yeah like guy fieri's (laughs) gonna be like not great you know (laughs) that would be honestly the most devastating because he seems really nice yeah like it's just you know when i when i did work in a kitchen i was telling you guys this last night like the first time i got to cook i was dishwasher for a long time great job favorite job i've ever had um but uh when I when I did get to cook, it was one of the chefs saying, "Make me an omelet." And it was Mother's Day brunch, and we had to make we had an omelet bar, and it was like, "You're on the omelet bar now. Make me an omelet." And it fucking sucked. Oh it was fucking horrifying. And I made like an American omelet where you like cook the eggs first, and then you do the fold thing, and it's yeah, the worst fucking way to cook an omelet. Hey, <laughs> I like them just fine. You're better. I couldn't. I could never figure that technique out. So you can do it. I still to this day cannot. But like that kind of pressure of like that they're sitting there like in the movie, like watching you do fucking everything. Yeah. Yeah. And if anything is wrong, especially in a situation like, like a fine dining kitchen like that, you have to redo it. Yeah. And, and like, oh man, it's, do you like your omelet? I, I did get to cook the rest of the brunch. So yeah, but he showed me how to cook a French omelet after that. He was a nice guy. If you were in this situation, what do you think would be the most foolproof that like, what would you, what would you pick? Like, what would I've you been make? thinking about this since yeah. yesterday. Like, what would I make? Yes, uh, steak. Okay. I, I like a steak is something that I feel very confident in. It's very difficult to fuck up if you know how to do it. But like, salt, it's, pepper, butter. Exactly. But it's also incredibly boring. Mm-hmm. So like, he would just be like, know. "Oh, how original!" Yeah, right. Steak. Like, oh, Ooh, yeah, like how... steak and asparagus. Cool. Yeah. Like, but like, what? What else do you do? Like, I'm not a chef. Like, duck, maybe. Like, you know. Like all the shit that I like says he's not a chef after he just cooked for twenty two people yeah. on Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Twenty three, fucking great. Uh, one person didn't show up. Yeah, it was going to be twenty four. Oh, okay. oh, 23. damn. Well, see, it's funny that you uh, that was your experience because for me in this movie, 
when he's lambasting the older couple who have been there 11 mm-hmm. times <laughs> and he asks them to name a single dish from the last time or any previous time that they were there and the guy can't and the wife tries to offer cod. Cod. It wasn't cod, you donkey. It was halibut. <laughs> yeah. That that was me being like, oh God, what if Gressel asked me to name a thing from like past Thanksgiving <laughs> and I couldn't do it? That made me feel sick. So- and then to start off this podcast, you said that they're the worst people there because of that. <laughs> I, I think that. I think that like that is... Them or the critic, like, are the most offensive. I think, like, because everybody else is, like, they're kind of representations of things that Julian feels. They're not, like, actually malicious to him or to other people. John Leguizamo was just there because... He's uh, just there because he didn't like the movie. He's, he's funny like, he's as hell. He saw Calling Dr. Sunshine on his one day off, and he he did not enjoy it. Yep. And Wasted John, his I precious John time. I was like, well, I didn't direct it or anything. He's like, but seeing your face... Just makes me so angry. Mm -hmm. That's so fun. That's like, I love the way that this movie is like, Julian is the villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's such a great example of it. But like, yeah, I I think that the the older couple and the critic are like personally malicious in a way that others are not. Like, like the the dude is, he's cheating on his wife. Mm -hmm. He's, he's harming her intentionally. And and then unintentionally harming and insulting Julian, and the, the the critic has like gotten restaurants shut down, and like has you know personally offended Julian too. Like, I I think that like if you have been to a restaurant like that where they explain, I mean, he says it. If we explain every dish, yeah, yeah and you can't remember what one dish that you had, like, yeah, it's like the type of person where oh something is expensive, then I must have yeah. it because I can afford it, and I. That is what or is... Or maybe they're just living in the moment, drinking lots of wine, and they can't remember all the stuff <laughs> that the server said to them because they don't know what half those words are. All right, ma'am? <laughs> maybe that's what happened. All right? They had a good time. They really liked the food. Sorry I don't they can't think they did. not pass the quiz. I think, but th- I think that's part of what, what Chef is saying is, like, for <laughs> him, he's putting so much into creating this art and creating this experience. And it's supposed to be this this once in a lifetime thing for most people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like the, 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 the chef's tastings that I've done, and I've only done a couple cause they're very expensive. I've done with the attitude of, I will never get to do this again. Mm-hmm. And like, they're, they're these kind of singular experiences and, and like to insult that by one, doing it 11 times. Yeah. And two, not caring. Like, to not, that, like, you know, that's like that gal who was just in the video that was going around who was in Mexico and, like, ran up the steps of the pyramid. And, like, you know, like, it's disrespecting something that is, like, like true art. And, like, you know, it, it, it'd be like, to, you know, it, it, it's talking through a movie in a movie theater. Like, it, it's just it's the disrespect mm-hmm. to, to somebody who is putting so much into creating something for you mm-hmm. is I think that makes them the the w- with the critic the worst people in this movie it makes me think of like being um like people who because we go to a lot of concerts like we really love seeing live music and I just think of people who see artists multiple times and are in like the front to the point where it's like not the show itself like they basically know the set list and maybe aren't as like visibly thrilled to be there because it's not like all new to them and i have to wonder from an artist's perspective how frustrating that might feel to Mm. just maybe have someone who kind of just compulsively goes to each of your shows but is like a like oh yeah i'm like a professional fan kind of thing yeah you know i feel like we've seen people like that before well that's the other thing tyler made me worry about me are we professional fans i mean that's part of what we we do but i i that is also why i think going back to the beginning of the podcast we have always said especially when there's a movie we don't like they made a movie we didn't we sit here talking about movies but i know like is is us trying to make a movie gonna be tyler's bullshit us us (laughs) making tyler's bullshit i certainly hope Ooh, a zombie story how original (laughs) no i think it's it's more the style of i think film critique where it's like a little bit above it and it's just the you know we're we're just gonna make fun of everything or rip Mm -hmm. it apart i mean that's not what tyler is doing but 
I don't know. Or just the maybe lack of appreciation sometimes for genuinely how in like much of a miracle every movie is. Like yeah. the fact that it gets made at all is like this this coordination of so many people. If and the sous chef is the cinematographer, I'll ask their name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. So, you know, I'm not saying that we're not kind of a Tyler when it comes to, to film because yeah, we, we are fans who our our product is we commentate on what other people have made. Mm-hmm. But I like to think we're at least a little bit aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Man. I think it, you're you're it, it's about being open to the artist's intent, whether you agree with it or not. You know, yeah. like like when I when I go out to eat, something that I'm always concerned about, especially when I, with you know like menus, like tasting menus, is what if I don't like something? Mm-hmm. You know, like like um, you know, we we did one recently that had some like pickled elements in the in the in the menu, and I'm not the biggest fan of fermented stuff, mm-hmm. and that's like really trendy right now, and mm-hmm. it's part of a lot of like like it's a big part of Korean cuisine and stuff, and uh, other you know cuisines and. I don't love it, and I'm so terrified of having to be like, I don't like this. Yeah. But like, I will try it because yeah. like that's what they're they're presenting this, and I will try it because they're presenting this with the intent of me enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And like having observed you guys cl- up close for most of the run of Dead Meat, <laughs> like you'll you will try anything anybody serves to you. You know, and whether or not it's it's your cup of tea is a different question, Mm -hmm. but you're never going to be closed off to with the exception of a few very specific things. Obviously, you're never going to be closed off to experiencing something. And I think that that's the difference. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, So now that chef thinks Anya Taylor-Joy is one of them, he assigns her duty to go get the barrel for the dessert Mm -hmm. from his cottage, which Elsa had said previously no one is allowed in. Mm -hmm. So she goes, uh, or no, it's actually from the smoke room. It's Yeah, but then she ends up. Well, she she goes to the smoke room, gets it, but then she goes to his cottage. Yeah, it's a little bit. I wonder if they cut something here because it felt like a very quick kind of like she no i think you were taking notes because i was watching it yeah it was fine yeah that's it because you like leaned over and you were like wait what and i was like yeah that's makes yeah i hate having to take notes notes. in a theater uh yes but she goes into his cottage and uh elsa follows her in there and attacks her because she doesn't want to be replaced Mm -hmm. with uh she she wants to be daddy's favorite girl yes and uh she's worried that Elsa will replace her. So there's a fun little fight scene. Where, yeah, that Margo will replace her. I'm sorry, her, that yeah. Margo will replace her. And during the fight scene, I didn't catch this. I was reading in the comments. When Tyler's cooking his bullshit uh, and his he says the lamb is done and Chef says, are you sure you don't want to put it in the, what is it? Oh, the, 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 the like the snow machine. Jet? Yeah, pop, yeah, 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 yeah. Something. Yeah, they, yeah. They, that's, that, that's what falls that's what during the fight. Over. Yeah, that, yeah, that happens during the fight. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Used. yeah. Which I guess is something that is used to uh, take frozen things and cut them into tiny pieces without thawing them. Yeah. It's what makes the snow. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Got it. I don't have one. <laughs> At the prices I saw, I'm not surprised, yeah. man. Um, well, because Tyler says I have one. Oh, he does. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Like that's that's another thing too that made me that made me shrink into my seat because when he's going through when they like first get in the kitchen and they're plating the amuse and he's explaining it to to Margot, he's like, they use this uh, pock jet to make the snow. I have one, oh, and it's like okay. mm, I have some bullshit downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> she goes into this other room in Chef's house and it's kind of like his bedroom. His secret room. It looks like his a memories. bunker, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's all these pictures on the wall. One of them is uh, like a newspaper review from when he kind of made his debut, I think, at this restaurant called Tantalus, which a lot of people pointed out is like the name of... Um, God, I wish I had my phone on me so I could just read the like mythology because now I don't know if I can like accurately recap it's this character from greek mythology who like ends up in the underworld right and Mm -hmm. what is it he serves up like his son is it his son i forget i think it's his son and there's a lot of yeah like eating and not being able to be satisfied yeah like a a, an unquenchable hunger and yeah it's it's one of those you know moral of the story yeah it's like a sisyphus kind of thing um which is interesting 
Um, Because, yeah, some people did also get kind of like purgatory feelings from this movie, which I didn't, Hmm. I don't know if I quite got, but I mean, Tantalus is like a very purposeful name choice. Yeah, they're in a place where they're being judged. Yeah, exactly. Then she also sees this picture of him at what I'm assuming is like his first job where he's a line cook at this hamburger place. And it's the only picture where he looks really happy. Yeah, he's smiling. Yeah. Um, then she also, finds a radio. She finds a radio and she she radios someone. And then when she comes back with the barrel, uh, there's this boat that you hear like a boat. And so everyone's like, oh my God, the Coast Guard's here. Thank fuck. And uh, that dude shows up and dale yeah and he notices dude oh john leguizamo oh shit i'm a huge fan at that movie uh calling, calling dr, dr. dr. sunshine, sunshine. <laughs> leguizamo shoots <laughs> ray finds a look yeah did Dang you it. guys think in this moment that leguizamo was gonna get out that like somebody liking the movie would have shown chef that like no Mm-mm. you didn't there, no. there wasn't no. any oh, i just I, assumed I, the coast guard would get killed yeah Oh, I wasn't sure. Or I sure. thought he would be like, I, I can, here, let's step outside. We can take like a picture or like a, or something. I just figured he was going to find some way to tell this Coast Guard, save us. And, and it's when he was like, here, I'll give you an autograph. Clearly. I mean, you know, I get it. It's a, it I, I, I maybe would do the same thing, but he's got to know that chef is going to know exactly what he's up to. I think it was a good plan. It's a, yeah. I mean, and well, no, chef were, set him up. Chef was like, do you want an autograph? Yeah, oh, here, look, here's a... That's true, yeah. yeah that's true. So instead of an autograph, he writes... He gave writes, him every opportunity to not do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. he writes, help me, folds it up, gives it to the Coast Guard guy. Coast Guard's unfolding out his way out the door. Takes out his gun. Great, yeah. great moment. Mm-hmm. They're all like, shoot, shoot yeah, him, shoot he's the bad guy. guy. And then he aims it at a candle and lights it. It's a, it's it's a, a gun lighter. lighter. It's like in a, 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 a Squid Game. He gets his... Remember at the very beginning of Squid Game where he gets his daughter the, oh, the yeah, gun, gun lighter, lighter. for a birthday right. present? <laughs> yeah. And, yep, turns out Dale, one of the cooks, and was in a picture with uh, Chef earlier yeah. on. So, like, if you if you yeah, noticed. Yeah, people notice that. It's around here, too, that Chef quotes Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> which is very funny. I forget it what the context It cuts to the, the one black guy who's uh, the tech bro. And just, like, it, it's not, like, a very, like... Like, oh, isn't this funny? It's just like a, a cut to where he's like, it's funny. What? Yeah, yeah. And they even are like, did he just? Is it, yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> very, very funny. Oh man, that's another example. I think of like, Chef is not the hero. No, yeah. God, no. Yeah, he's co-opting Dr. Martin Luther King's quotes for yeah. what he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all about him. Uh, this is when Andy Taylor Joy finally figures out how she can get out of there. And she does the little chef clap. Yeah, she claps her hands. She says, I don't like your food and I would like to send it back. Which earlier, Tyler had said, you don't do you that. Don't you don't send, send stuff back. back Yeah, in this kitchen. And I love this. This is the, this like re- weird ratatouille kind of scene. <laughs> well, she, <laughs> like what Erica said too. Yeah. She fucking dresses him down saying like this food... F- is not made with love. Love is the most important ingredient. You said that. And this and isn't made with and love. And he's like, it is made with love. We cook everything here with love, don't we? <laughs> yes, chef. <laughs> yeah. And she's just dressed him down saying, no, and worse off, I'm hungry. You're a chef. Your job is to feed people food that they want to eat. You have not done that with me. Mm-hmm. I want a cheeseburger. Yeah. Th- this whole exchange is fucking great. It's really good. And it's interesting because Pete, I saw, I can't take credit for like observing this, but I was reading a review of this where they pointed out that this, not only is this him finding joy again in, in serving food to someone, this is also her finding joy in providing this experience. You know, she is like almost role playing with him and providing oh, yeah. this like, you know, similar to uh, her having to lock eyes with that guy and tell him he's a good person. She is putting him the chef back mentally in the place where he last enjoyed cooking so mm-hmm. it's like this they're both kind of finding this um you know they're earlier yeah returning to like the things that you know the the aspects to what they do that made them happy yeah so uh, she, yeah she asked for it just a well-made cheeseburger and yep, then she takes the a few course. bites clearly it's fucking good but then she <laughs> asks and it's so funny. She as she says, my eyes are bigger than my stomach, which of course they are. Her eyes are gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> she asks for a box, which is very, very funny. Yeah, can I get the rest to go? Yes. And, and so he gives her 
the little and that, that's thing. the like can i get out of here can yeah. i get the rest to go can i please and he says not die? yeah i'll give you the rest to go and now he lets her go and she does pause and look back at all the others and she tips ten dollars oh no she paid for the burger yep she oh, just paid for the burger it was ten dollars okay. and fries it came with fries oh that's right he said it was like 9.90 she did not tip that's yeah. right uh but yeah. i mean would you <laughs> she goes <laughs> right. they, they're not they're a non-tipping restaurant oh that's, that's right. right he does chef say that. explains mm-hmm. gratuities included and she leaves and she looks back at the other people. I'm like, take at least some of them. Take the assistant. But the wife uh, is the last one in the slow sweep. And she's like, yeah, she motions for Amy yeah. Taylor Joy to go. My reading of why uh, why Chef lets her go is because she was a giver. She gave yeah. him something. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I love that so Everyone much. Else took. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else was taken from Selfishly him. Selfishly took. And she gave it back. And like he said, she was uh, one of them, one of the service industry and not just to take her. Mm-hmm. Yep. The rest of them represent the ruin of his art and his life. <laughs> yep. So they and get to be a part of the dessert course. <laughs> S'mores. But they all pay for it. Yep. They all put in their... <laughs> so they, they all throw their credit cards, cards, which is so The tech funny. bros all tossing their cards in is hilarious because it's just like they would at a, a restaurant. And it's funny because the difference between all of them paying with cards and she puts cash on the table. Oh, is yeah. Because yeah. mm. I think servers... Servers prefer to be paid with cash, sure. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always, that's why I try to carry cash for tips. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the last course is s'mores, and they all get these little marshmallow capes kind of put on them. And, and these caps. little chocolate hats. It's very funny. And they all say, thank you, chef, at the end as these lighten the torch to light them all up. And this was a direct reference to what? Because you yeah, showed us this I, last Yes. Night this, I believe, is a direct reference to the uh, Alenia dessert from... Uh, chef's table so if you want to see if if you if you haven't seen it and you want to see kind of what i think directly inspired this entire movie Mm -hmm. watch uh uh season two episode of chef's table on grant atkins from alenia because what it's just like the table itself gets covered it's covered in in sauces and food and and snow and there's a big there's a frozen thing that he claps and it pops and i just just give me food that I can eat, dude. It yeah. can be fancy, but I don't want to have to fucking lick it off the table. Yeah. And like you're sharing it with how many other people? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here with that. It's, yeah. It does seem like this, from the stuff that you showed us on Chef's Table, it seems like they had an idea. It, it said it was inspired by like a trip to a fancy restaurant, but I bet they had that idea and then binged that show mm-hmm. and rode around that and it worked great. Yeah. So then he... uh lights this whole place up the the barrel that she got for dessert was like a a, a fuel of some yeah. sorts because that whole place blows up and uh the final course or dessert includes the, the, cooks, yeah, the, the ing- customers yeah, and the restaurant yeah, yeah, yeah i have a theory that because that barrel was in the smokehouse that it was animal fat but mm-hmm. that's based on oh, nothing okay i just think it'd be a fun thing yeah <laughs> makes sense for like a fatty dessert and then she eats her cheeseburger on the boat yeah and wipes her mouth with the menu that's right yeah i really really can't wait to get this movie on blu-ray and see if it says on the menu that she has at the end r.i.p jeremy Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i like his rant too about s'mores and how s'mores (laughs) represent the worst of accurate I love s'mores, though. They they're taste so good. They're a fucking good. mess. They there, are a there mess, but no they're so good. Neat way to eat s'mores. No, but it's oh, they just taste so fucking good. But yeah, he's like it's it's unethically sourced chocolate, <laughs> sugar water that's ju- like uh jello gel- factory made graham crackers. Yeah, and like yeah. processed factory made graham crackers. Yeah. It represents like the worst of us. Yet it's like associated with childhood innocence. I think he says. How you feel about s'mores? I think they're incredibly difficult to make right. I'm good at it. Like you gotta, you, you gotta, gotta wait. Cook that. You gotta have your fire, your campfire, but you wait until it's like the fire's not quite dead, but it's like about to, where you have mostly embers, and then you roast your marshmallows. You can't have like just fire. But also, the chocolate's got to start to melt. Yeah. But the res- the residual heat of the marshmallows yeah, should melt the chocolate pretty fast. Yeah. But like that's that's the tricky thing, and it's like how far do you take it? That's but kind then, of a personal but then preference it's a, thing. Big puffed oh, up marshmallow. I agree with you. There there is no good way to eat it. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, because then like when you bite down, it presses the hard graham cracker together, and that scalding hot marshmallow leaks out into your mouth and just burns a huge surface area. 
It's dumb. And it's like gooey. It. It's like fucking melt. It's like molten plastic. I can, just sticking to the inside of your I'll mouth. I'll make you a good burning s'more. Burning you. I'll make you a good s'more. Yeah. Well, you played it well. Yes, I'll play it very beautifully. I just, I'm very good. I feel like I can roast a very good marshmallow. All right. All right. Well, that's the menu. Uh, I really fucking enjoyed it. Hey, I did too. It's, I think it's, it's very it's, funny. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and I think it's it's like a it's a unique premise, and I'm assuming it's kind of like mid budget. You know. I mean, who, with all the people in it, though, I bet they were expensive. Mm. I think the food was expensive. Ooh, you think yeah, so? too. Yeah, Dominic you think 20 mil? That sounds about right. Sure. But they built that place. I, I assumed oh, it yeah. was a set. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that'd be the easiest way to get all they, the shots The exteriors you need are somewhere in Georgia, and then they built, this, they built the set, and they built the restaurant. 30 mil is its oh, listed budget you're pretty when close. I Google it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sounds about right. Yeah, I mean, you got to think a bit, a, a decent chunk of that is Anya Taylor Joy, Ray Fiennes, Ray, Ray there's, Fiennes, there's names yeah, in it. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I think it's a lot of fun. Like, I just this is what there just should be more movies out like this where it's not this isn't a big blockbuster. It's just mid budget original good. film. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know where you find a lot of those. Horror. Horror. <laughs> That's what I said to Erica when we were leaving when we got home yesterday. Like, do we just like horror movies now? <laughs> they're fucking original. Yeah, yes. they're That's telling what it original is. stories. That's what it is. Yeah, and there's so many different kinds. Of yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's just, I never get sick of them because they're all so fucking different and I love them. Yeah. Great. Uh, this comes out after, after. we're at Midsummer or not Midsummer Season Screamings. But if you saw us there... Thanks for coming by. Yeah. Yeah. This comes out after we were there. So hopefully it was fun. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Gressel, for editing while you were on the episode. <laughs> yep. I'm sorry for how sloppy the edit is. That's okay. Well, sorry, Josh, for we'll whoever has to do this. Yeah. Thank you, editors, for editing this. <laughs> and thank you for providing all the wonderful context and uh, uh, enrichment that the the accompaniments. <laughs> the accom- yes, exactly. The accompaniments. The accompaniments. Yeah, yeah. The accoutrement. You really gave us the, the sauce to make this dish even tastier. <laughs> Would you guys do a tasting menu? Yeah. When you were talking about last oh, night, Oh, like, like going to one? Yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. You said Anna Jack does it? They do. It's very, very hard to get into It'd be that fun one. to go to a really pretentious one. No, not if it's not if it's bullshit food. It has to be like real food because sure. I'm not I'm not gonna pay that for fucking little gels and, and bullshit. That you're not gonna I yeah. think you guys would really love Anaka. That's it's, if it's Japanese real food, I'll do it, But yeah. yeah, none of that, Maybe none like, of that fucking foam shit. Get, I'm a, I'm a growing yeah. boy. You I know who used Japanese. to work at Alinea? The chef at Pajoli. Really? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. That place is dope. That place is so good. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, catch us on the flip side. Bye. Yeah. Oh, bye. <laughs> no, I'm social sorry. Debbie social James at, uh, at Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And I'm Carebeck, C R E V E C C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, store.com. Should people follow you anywhere, man? D and D D, the podcast that we do, the three of us and Beth and Mike do a podcast that's been going for a long time. A long time. It's about food. It's it, yeah. it is. It's it's a fantasy story inspired by food, and uh, I I love it. Go listen to it. Yeah. Do that. Go do that. And then catch us on the flip side. (laughs) Bye. Bye.